Namaste and greetings. I, Dr. Saurabhi Hinire, Research and Communication Associate at IMPRI, Impact and Policy Research Institute, Prabhav Evamniti Anusandhan Samstan, May Dindi, extend my warmest welcome to you all to IMPRI Web Policy Learning. We are gathered today for the last day of a three-day online certificate training program on implementing rainwater conservation, practitioners' perspectives on rainwater harvesting and efficient local water governance and resilience. This training course is organized by National Institute of Disaster Management, NIDM, Ministry of Home Affairs, and Center for Environment, Climate Change, and Sustainable Development, or CECCSD IMPRI, Impact and Policy Research Institute, New Delhi. The patron for the program is Shri Taj Hassan, IPS, Executive Director, NIDM, New Delhi. Our convener and moderator is Shri Tikender Singh Panwar, former Deputy Mayor, Shimla, Senior Fellow, IMPRI. Our conveners are Professor Anil K. Gupta, Head of ECDRM, NIDM, New Delhi. Dr. Simi Mehta, CEO and Editorial Director, IMPRI and Dr. Soumya Dev Chattopadhyay, Associate Professor, Vishwa Bharati Shantiniketan, Visiting Senior Fellow, IMPRI, New Delhi. This course will be conducted by various expert resource persons comprising eminent academicians, journalists, senior researchers, and policy practitioners. The distinguished resource persons have great experience gained in the field along with their expertise. Our experts for today's training sessions are Dr. Sri Ranjan Panda, Panda and Professor Arun Kumar. Sri B. R. Raman unfortunately could not join us today because of illness and hospitalization. Our organizing team are Dr. Shweta Bedde Das, NIDM, Dr. Saurabhi Himire, Utkash Divedi, and Divya, sorry, Dia Goswami. Imprint. This three-day online training program intends to bring together professionals from academia, civil society, and the business and entrepreneurial sectors to begin a critical conversations about our times. The ultimate purpose of this program is to develop a group of practitioners for mainstreaming sustainable and affordable rainwater harvesting in urban India. We are very grateful to the NIDM team and particularly Professor Anil K. Gupta and his team, and Vikendar Panwarji for spearheading this timely training course on the topic of rainwater harvesting and local governance. I welcome all of you for this enlightening deliberation and thank you for being inter interested and putting your time, energy, and efforts in understanding emerging issues concerning the impacts of policies in disaster management and helping us to bring together the practitioners and participants to this course, which we believe will lead to a very fruitful, fruitful outcome. Before we start today's session, I would like to remind the housekeeping announcements once again. Please join the meeting on time. There will be Q&A session after each presentation. Kindly share the question on the Q&A box. The questions must not be posted as an anonymous attendee and ensure that the questions are precise. Also, refrain from making any general comments in the questions to save time. Now, I would like to welcome Professor Anil K. Gupta, head of ECDRM and IDM New Delhi to open the sessions for today. Welcome, sir, the floor is yours. So thank you. Dr. Sarvi for beginning the session and my compliments to IMPRI team and an IDM team for choosing this very, very important topic. I am here in the cold desert of India, Ladakh. And in fact, today I am also keeping a little unwell uh, because of the weather. Uh, perturbations here, but it's a very important 
uh, discourse going on for this three days. Uh, when I am discussing on the climatic and disaster resilience issues here in Ladakh also, which receives very less amount of water, less amount of rainfall. So catching each and every drop of rain is important. Where there is a very scanty rainfall, as well as in the areas where there is very heavy rainfall also. So I consider that rain, rainwater harvesting or rainwater conservation or in a broader sense, rainwater management, I would say that it's a miracle technology. And I would say that even no need to use the word technology because it's a, a not great techno, technical interventions or innovations involved. The things are known. Only thing that how do we start practicing it, how we popularize it, how do we integrate into our developmental settings. Uh, most of the parts of the country, most, most part of the country, the cities have common problems like a uh, few months we have the challenges of floods, our waterlogging and later on we have the challenge of water scarcity and alongside that we have the challenges of the disease spread and so, so many other aspects including the impact of heat wave also. So rainwater harvesting cuts across several kind of disaster challenges and several layers of climatic risks. So this is a way most common and most acceptable approach, but is still it's, it's very, very uh, long journey ahead to really popularize it uh, to, be, to be practiced in the ground at all levels. We have very good examples of rainwater harvesting in India from the historical times also. If we look at some historical monuments, we find that rainwater harvesting has been implicit in those buildings or structures. However, that knowledge did not continue and that traditional wisdom also uh, got somewhere away from popularization. So now it is a very uh, important initiative that has been taken by IMPRI and my colleague in an IDM, Dr. Shweta, my dear friend, uh, Mr. Tekinder, Dr. Arjun, Dr. Simi. Uh, this team has been always taking very important topics for a series of discourses for addressing the challenges of climate uh, climate risk. India being a diverse country, we have all kinds of challenges. We have the challenge of heat, we have the challenges of drought, we have the challenges of floods, we have the challenges associated with the climate in terms of the, the disease spread, forest fire, so many other things. Cities are also now facing multiple uh, challenges. And as I uh, refer to that rainwater conservation or rainwater management uh, comes as a miracle solution, uh, cutting across several kind of uh, dimensions of these challenges. So I'm very happy that this uh, initiative has been taken. And uh, I would suggest to uh, Dr. Shweta uh, from an IDM and the colleagues from IMPRI uh, that we come out with the most important points, not only that, what are the tools and techniques involved in uh, rainwater conservation, but how to popularize it, uh, what are the pathways to, to mainstream it uh, into urban planning and urban management. That is, that is very important. And also to identify that what are the faults, what are the mistakes that often people do in promoting uh, rainwater conservation because in Delhi also in many other cities we find that uh, rainwater uh, harvesting structures are there but not working very effectively. So these two dimensions if we can 
uh, capture uh, as as uh, the the key outcomes or key lessons of this three days uh, discourse also and come up with a uh, with some kind of a awareness material or ic material so that can also help and then we can pass it on, on to uh, the the uh, the uh, the local uh, urban local uh, bodies also and other agencies which are into the capacity building and awareness on related aspects so uh, my best wishes and uh, thanks and uh, i could not join on day one and now also there's, there's there's some internet issue also here and now we got some health uh, challenges also because ladakh is very high altitude and uh, you see it, uh, the weather perturbations are also there so thank you very much and uh, my compliments and uh, over to you uh, uh, miss sorvi for uh, taking the agenda forward thank you thank you uh, professor gupta uh, for uh, opening the sessions and uh, giving an overview about this uh, course so now i'm uh, moving uh, on to our uh, convener and moderator i would like to invite shri tikender singh panwar ji to share some words before we begin with our expert session for this last day so over to you Kendra, sir. Some issues, Dr. Sarvi. We can uh, go to a recorded lecture by Vya Raman, sir, if you can introduce. Him. Just a second. I think uh, we can just move on to uh, Professor Vya Raman. And he has sent us a recorded video, so uh, we can uh, start with the video. Dr. Arjun, let's begin the video. Being part of this. Uh, so we have uh, structured this presentation in three parts, the discussion in three parts. One uh, will you know, contextualize the issue and you know, the, establish the uh, wash climate uh, you know climate change linkages and the need uh, you know kind of a thing and the second part will uh, you know look at the kind of interventions uh, you know the water aid has done uh, in some of these areas uh, to understand it and to address it in a uh, as a, as a beginning and then we will go into uh, a recent uh, kind of thing that we developed about an agenda of action that could be applicable for most of the uh, water sector uh, organizations. Uh, so we had, uh, you know, in water aid, the climate change uh, uh, and the wash integration was happening as part of a process. Uh, when we were starting to work on, uh, you know, from a service delivery approach to a uh, rights-based approach almost a decade ago, <clears throat> uh, uh, and then, you know, moving into the directions of sustainable development goals, so it was important that unless, uh, you know, all the various, uh, uh, you know, initiatives that we are uh, putting forward are connected with, uh, uh, you know, some of the overarching issues. If they are not connected with some of the overarching issues, uh, probably what we may achieve will not sustain and that will not be beneficial uh, for the purpose. Uh, for which it has been, uh, you know, uh, done. So this this realization is something that over the last two years we are looking at, uh, you know, integrating, uh, you know, all various activities of water aid into the lens of uh, climate change. And uh, some uh, five six years before we started to conceptualize this, to understand this, and to you know kind of do this. So last year in uh, water aid India. We had uh, two major initiatives that was happening. One was, you know, to uh, put together uh, a, uh, you know, kind of draft approach paper, which further Amulya and myself, you know, we are working on it. One which uh, Dr. Shivathena Reddy uh, supported us in uh, putting together some of the, you know, kind of details uh, on this. And further, we, uh, you know, are now working on it in the context of the strategy of water aid and the overall a water sector organization's perspective. Similarly, we are also trying to understand uh, some of the, you know, what related climate change challenges through a partnership research. Uh, Amulya will uh, give some details of that uh, later. 
and uh, uh, we are also you know part of the water and climate change campaign globally we have rolled out that uh, you know involves advocacy that involves a lot of uh, initiatives uh, and in india as part of a trans boundary uh, water security program some four uh, years before we started the uh, participatory vulnerability assessment and related uh, initiatives for uh, uh, you know water uh, conservation as well those are those are also something the details uh, that amulya will be coming so here what i'm going to uh, do is to put up a brief context of uh, climate linkages of wash <clears throat> so first you know as we uh, it is not just uh, uh, mitigation as uh, indra has already told it is also about building uh, the, the the kind of preventive mechanism and preparedness mechanism and the resilience in the community in addition to mitigating the risks of uh, uh, climate change in the water sector so we one of the problem of uh, the narrative of the climate change is that that is where i want to begin with the climate change narrative starts from outside this, this is a problem <clears throat> the problem is that we see it from the temperature and the temperature is something external to the place that we are living i mean although it is part of the uh, you know solar system or universe or whatever uh, to the earth that we are living as human kind uh, the uh, temperature Uh, is something that we see as uh, you know flowing from outside, but you know we need to see climate change actually from an internal perspective, wherein there are several factors that adds to the change of uh, temperature from outside, which is you know related to our own kind of movements or advancement uh, as human kind, which we call uh, under the development frame. So that is where the sustainable tag has been added to the development. How to sustain the development in a way that next generation can also uh, benefit it in a way that uh, we ourselves can uh, you know take the benefit of it in the, in the long run so this understanding is missing so that is where water becomes the core of uh, climate change for me so if we see uh, climate change from the lens of water uh, that would make it more live uh, than a kind of hypothetical understanding of climate change uh, from the temperature perspective so i would like to present Uh, climate center of climate change as uh, you know water extending that to wash that would uh, you know uh, give more uh, you know kind of space and uh, uh, you know interventional opportunities for water sector organizations so i am a bit uh, uh, you know contextually and uh, uh, intentionally uh, giving this uh, you know narrative uh, so the need of the paradigm shift uh, from temperature to water <clears throat> the second part is that uh, how we are consum consuming water so there is a fold a four fold increase that we are seeing over the last 70 years and further 20 30 percentage we are seeing as part of the urbanization uh, and uh, then in india we have lot of worries uh, uh, of the inter increasing disasters indra has already told about them high frequency of the flash floods uh, rain rainfall events droughts uh, heat waves tropical cyclone lot of event eventualities are happening here and uh, uh, access to water services has been eventually uh, impacted uh, because of this and uh, if you look at uh, the another outcome of the health related morbidity and mortality i am putting up the indicator of mortality here uh, close to 11500 uh, you know deaths happened uh, in the five year time just because of uh, water related uh, health uh, challenges uh, we call it water borne diseases but there can be something more to that so i am not including everything uh, as water borne diseases i am uh, putting a term as water related challenges here <coughs> health challenges here and then drinking water availability and environmental sanitation including the efforts that we put up for solid and uh, liquid based management access to the hygiene all these gets affected uh, because of this and uh, <coughs> we need to also see uh, climate change from uh, you know a lens that it is a key and important component of uh, climate change adaptation and resilience even during the normal circumstances wherein the uh, challenges are not caused and even post disaster situation so this is how uh, the climate change and uh, uh, wash is related so the impacts on what we can see that uh, rapid urbanization Uh, uh you know that leads to acute water scarcity and high demand for the basic water services so uh, there is a uh, 55.2 percentage of urban population rise uh, that has been uh, projected by 2050 uh, with comparison to 2007 uh, so this is something a very 
uh, you know in, uh, what you call considerable uh, kind of instrumental kind of high and uh, there is a decreasing trend in the monsoon rainfall the south india is now on monsoons it is already two days delayed uh, you know as per the uh, report that we are seeing so there is a uh, clear decline in the uh, you know overall monsoon and uh, groundwater uh, depletion uh, is also one issue we are uh, extracting groundwater from aquifers beyond the uh, whatever could be recharged or uh, you know refilled that you know beyond that we are going so uh, you can see that two reports recently one at the central groundwater board and the other one at the niti ayog both of them are suggesting water stress is going up the number of uh, administrative regions uh, that is affected by water stress is quite high compared to 10 years before or 20 years before and uh, then the land use pattern and the land cover pattern that is also quite uh, significantly changing that is also uh, becoming a reason for non recharge of uh, uh, groundwater and aquifers Uh, and urban infrastructure in this uh, is uh, adding more vulnerabilities because the mo most of the land is getting covered so that is another uh, issue there and uh, then our own uh, programs like swachh bharat mission or uh, uh, you know the <clears throat> waste management initiatives the errors and you know some technological and technical errors that is happening as part of this mass uh, and large scale programs also are contributing to this uh, uh, dilemma so water and environmental uh, dilemma is getting added up uh, so these are uh, you know something that uh, we we should see as impact on wash and uh, let us uh, see uh, uh, you know climate change induced disasters what is the kind of uh, impact so we have mass migration that is happening uh, of population uh, because of uh, floods or because of droughts uh, and similarly uh, decreased uh, access to water services uh, lives are kind of uh, kind of you know we are losing and uh, property we are losing and uh, livelihoods are very heavily kind of affected and psychologically there is a lot of effects on uh, population and we have uh, purchasing power and production that has been increased and economic growth and development is continuously getting uh, <clears throat> uh, hindered and uh, there are uh, clear political and policy implications for these as well so if we see that uh, uh, poverty and inequality are the key underlying uh, socio economic uh, drivers uh, that uh, is going to increase india's uh, climate vulnerability <clears throat> so this is something that we need to understand from the climate uh, perspective so floods and uh, droughts unless we are able to understand the causes of them or prevent uh, to the extent it is possible uh, things are going to be worse for us then uh, examples of some uh, you know actions by the government i am not putting up uh, all the detailed list here it is just examples all the names are listed so i am not going to read them uh, so climate change adaptation strategies by government of india in the context of what there is a lot of program you can see that it starts from jal jeevan mission and uh, from health department various other departments there are a lot of initiatives that they have tried to start there is a mission on climate action but however we don't know uh, exactly what is the spend or what has been done under that Uh, it is it is there as a mission in the niti ayog and various website we know that there is a mission there is a uh, initiative that has been started but how it is running what is the mission management mode we exactly don't know about it and then in 21 22 the budgets we are looking at 6 percentage height we are seeing from the expenditure of 1920 so that is not sufficient for looking at uh, and actually achieving uh, climate uh, mitigation or uh, climate uh, adaptation so uh, it is just uh, 0.1 percentage of the estimated expenditure of the union government that is one one issue that uh, we need to understand and then uh, <clears throat> various uh, flagship programs uh, you know there are uh, they are integrated through whether it is mg narega nrlm urban livelihood mission all that uh, but how much it is getting integrated is a question that we need to understand and finally uh, the civil society organizations yes you know in on papers we can see that there is uh, increasing role of uh, civil society organization but actually how much it is is something that we need to uh, reflect upon so there is a little more than you know what has been listed here but we need to ask ourselves that uh, whether this is enough or not or we need to do more this is how uh, the overall situation is now look at uh, climate financing so if you see the overall impact of uh, climate change in the water sector you can see that from the below how the groundwater kind of extraction without proper regulation or recharging that depletes the water level 
then it goes into next you know when the water level gets depleted the water quality geogenic contamination comes in and then when, when it does uh, the poor sanitation infrastructure and also waste management processes are adding to this and then hi poor hygiene leading to uh, morbidities and also poor hospital hygiene leading to overuse of antibiotics and you know antimicrobial contamination of water and then all these require more fresh water for us and again we are depleting so this is the wash uh, you know related cycle of uh, uh, water use so we need to really understand uh, climate change from this lens how can we prevent uh, the climate change because of the water depletion is a question that we need to uh, more and more ask so we need to see groundwater levels and groundwater contamination as the prominent indicator of climate change from the water sector and we look at uh, uh, you know climate financing it is less than one percentage for wash and uh, while you know we are seeing agriculture industry infrastructure development etc as the major contributors we need to really see wash also as a important sector here and we need to argue and advocate for uh, better financing uh, climate financing for uh, water sector i'll now hand over to uh, amulya for putting up some of the experiences and some of the in initiatives that water aid has done in the uh, you know climate change uh, and wash uh, you know that bridging uh, kind of initiative that we have done over uh, last few years over to amulya thank you amulya thank you so much raman and uh, good evening everyone um, thank you so much to impri and to dr indira uh, and also raman for uh, giving me this opportunity um, and i am glad that raman has set this context straight uh, for this discussion so i am not going to dwell deep into that but going to share a little bit about the works that water aid india has been doing in the past few years and how we are planning to approach and integrate climate change within all wash actions that we are planning to take so if we look at some of the studies that we have undertaken uh, we are through the policy department as well as the programs department within water aid in 2017 we have uh, conducted a study which uh, talks about the sustainability of toilets that were constructed as part of the swachh bharat mission or the toilets in general in different parts of the country and one of the uh, biggest findings from this particular study was that uh, during the uh, period 2017 we have found that 31% of the toilets that we have looked into are found to be unsafe when we say unsafe what is it that we mean we mean that these toilets are not suitable for the terrains that they are in or these toilet technologies that are used are not sustainable or there are certain types of toilets such as the uh, single pit toilets which require the direct human interface with uh, fecal matter so that means engaging manual scavenging persons uh, and everything so why is it important for us to also look at this is because uh, uh, until a few years ago perhaps it wouldn't have been important for us to think about oh what will happen if my uh, toilet is say not at a safe distance from my water source but that is not the discussion anymore because of the erratic droughts and the flood situation that raman has mentioned and also dr indira had clearly mentioned and something that all of us have come across in the recent past things are very unpredictable in areas there are severe droughts you are suddenly seeing a severe flooding situation or there are like erratic patterns as a result there is quite a lot of groundwater contamination and a lot of flooding uh, in sanitation systems especially when we are talking about small towns and rural areas where there is no proper fecal sludge management people are having to empty these septic tanks and toilet pits so with changing climate and changing climatic patterns these things are only bound to worsen we have also noticed that 36% of the toilets are safe but they are not sustainable and as dr indira had mentioned in the context sustainability and resilience are extremely important when we are trying to integrate wash with the climate change lens so when we are talking about any toilet structure it is not just important that there is a toilet structure but it is also important for us to consider what is the type of structure what is the terrain that the structure is in what are the socio economic norms that the area is in and everything so if, if we do not take into consideration different aspects while constructing toilets or any sort of sanitation or water infrastructure the sustainability and resilience of these things in the future to come where the predictions are that 1.5 degrees uh, you know the increase in temperature or depletion of groundwater to a level where most cities and areas will be water stressed will burden much more 
And uh, whilst in 2017, we have seen that 33% of the toilets that we have surveyed are sustainable and safe, we do not know what the situation is right now. While in 2017, there were new toilets and constructed at that point in time and had some sort of uh, um, septic tanks or uh, storage pits. What is the situation right now? Are they being emptied? Are they not being emptied? Uh, is the practice of manual scavenging still going on? How is this going to look like in the future to come when the implications of climate change are only going to worsen? Post this particular study, 2019, we have then conducted another study wherein we also wanted to check different topographies, different geographies, and then try to understand what are the type of toilet substructures that are there and how efficient are they and what is required uh, you know, in terrain specificity. So when we looked at that particular study, if you can, you can look at this particular graph and say that uh, in areas where there is black soil or in desert uh, uh, sort of terrains, uh, you know, you, the usage of substructures is good enough that, you know, there wouldn't be any issue with flooding and everything. But if we look at uh, flood prone areas with high water table, 43.7% of the structures were found to be not suitable for the terrain. So that means while there are these structures, what is going to happen when there is an occasion of a severe flood or a drought? What is going to happen when the impacts of climate change are going to worsen? This is something that we have started looking through as part of our studies is it's not just water or sanitation or hygiene, but whatever it is that we are looking at, we need to also look at it through the lens of climate change. What is it going to look like five to 10 years from now when the impacts of climate change are only going to worsen? Sorry. So recently, after, 20, uh, after our initial study in 2017 and then another study in 2019, in 2020, we have conducted another study in the small and medium towns across India, wherein we have surveyed 1,200 households, of which 84.6%, 80, a very high number of households, have been told to have their toilet structure at a very unsafe distance from their groundwater, at an unsafe horizontal distance, that means less than 10 meter distance between where the toilet and its substructure is to where the groundwater source, their major source of drinking water is. Uh, of these households, only 40% of the households have reported that they have septic tanks, uh, but then the remaining do not even understand what is underneath their toilet structure or what is going to happen or how ground, groundwater gets contaminated as a result of fecal matter. So this was something that we have found and this is something that you know uh, we are looking at and would urge all organizations on this front also to look at is how like when you're talking about sanitation structures why is it important for us to take into consideration the sustainability of a toilet structure or why is it important for us to con construct resilient sanitation infrastructure is something that we are uh, quite keenly looking at and something that you know we are planning to look at in the future to come as well Bidia, password batao andar aa jao password mask safai duri dhulai Also, as Raman had mentioned, uh, one of the big initiatives that we have taken to integrate uh, water at its focus, but also taking into consideration sanitation and hygiene and integrating it with climate change is something called the Jal Chaupal model. Jal Chaupal is basically a democratic approach of, for uh, and a water platform that integrates the communities, making sure that uh, 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 you know people and the communities get a, a voice and express what their requirements are, what their needs are, and understand about what is the situation within their village and how they can uh, improve their groundwater situation, as well as ensuring that whatever measures they are taking are climate resilient. Given that majority of the areas that we work in are either drought prone or uh, flood prone, it is important that we uh, bring that awareness within the communities as to why it is important for us to take care of our water infrastructure and also giving them a platform to express their grievances, express their troubles, express what is it that they want to do rather than a top-down model. Church of All looks at, at a bottom-up approach wherein we are trying to converge uh, different local governments with the communities and providing a safe space for these communities whilst also providing them any sort of technical assistance such as uh, you know giving them uh, technical advice on what how to integrate into uh, uh, watershed management 
or how do we uh, ensure water budgeting or trying to talk to the communities and train them with water quality testing and different approaches and also supporting local governments with different policy and decision making processes and uh, one of the big studies that we have done uh, as part of this is in Banda district of Uttar Pradesh wherein uh, we have introduced this Jal Chopal model in 435 different gram panchayats, held uh, meetings with all more than 20,000 community members and brought awareness among them about the need for uh, safe and uh, uh, secure water usage and water uh, storage and uh, conservation, as well as uh, the impact of climate change that they have and how they could potentially manage and mitigate this. And recently, uh, in 20, uh, end of 2020-21, uh, uh, we have started a collaboration with the University of California, Santa Barbara, wherein currently we are working with uh, seven different student researchers uh, who are working in different uh, parts of uh, remotely uh, because of the pandemic. If it weren't for the pandemic, the students would have been in India and have uh, gone to different locations that we have selected, taking into consideration the risk factor. When we talk about climate change uh, and when we thought about what, what could be the areas that can be imp uh, impacted severely in the coming five to 10 years because of climate change, uh, the first thing that comes into mind is uh, coastal and disaster prone areas. And then there are also these tribal areas and underserved communities. There are drought prone areas and uh, remote rural areas. There are hilly and mountain terrains which use traditional water sources such as springs. And we also have uh, emerging urban population, especially in terms of census towns, if we look at, and the increasing rate of urban poor within these settings. And also there are areas uh, uh, which are acutely affected by water quality, may that be fluoride, arsenic, microbes, salinity, and everything. So we have considered seven different locations across India taking into consideration each of these factors and have assigned each student researcher to different parts uh, across the country. We are working in Uttar Pradesh, we are working in Orissa, we are working in Madhya Pradesh, uh, in Karnataka, um, and uh, a, a couple of locations in Madhya Pradesh, Shivpuri and Dhar. So we are trying to look at what is it that is happening in these areas. Historically, has there been any change in the past, say, 1500 years? What has the rainfall pattern been like? What have the changes been like? What is the existing climate variability in these regions? And what are they anticipating in the near future to come? What are the communities themselves trying to do rather than us uh, trying to look at literature and understand what is happening? We're trying to interact with community using participatory appraisal tools and try to get uh, their take on uh, what is climate change and how they are looking at climate change and what they are doing to address climate change. So we are having different case studies and stories that are developing at this point in time with a lot of lessons from the community-based adaptation and the practices that they follow. And also we are trying to look at what are the various drivers of vulnerability that are uh, keeping the most marginalized and the poor people at risk. And what are the different policy and program level changes that we can take as uh, based on the learnings from this study moving forward? And also, how do we uh, form these synergies between uh, uh, climate vulnerabilities, local development needs, and cultural aspirations, whilst also focusing on the livelihoods of communities is something we are uh, trying to look at. And uh, so far, because of the pandemic, the uh, flow of the study has slowed down in the past two months, but in the next month or a month and a half, we are going to come up with a series of case studies wherein the students are going to present their uh, findings and we are hopeful that, you know, these set of case studies will be a first step for uh, water aid and also for many more sector organizations for us uh, to effectively include water and climate change together and also think about ways forward uh, with integrating climate change, sustainability, and resilience with WASH. Um, so with that, I will uh, give it again to Raman to discuss about the agenda. Thank you. So thanks. Uh, so one thing is, you know, based on all these experiences, we were trying to quickly put together a framework for action or an agenda for action for WASH sector organizations, uh, both for, you know, uh, adaptation uh, of, you know, climate change initiatives, resilience, preparedness, etc., and also, uh, you know, kind of mitigation measures uh, when something happens. Uh, what all can be the immediate thing that the WASH sector organizations can focus on these things is the question that uh, we are trying to look at. 
Help speed sensitivity fast. Sensodyne Rapid Relief. <clears throat> so, uh, the community level, what all are the key requirements when it comes to climate change adaptation strategies? Uh, so, with integrated uh, water resource management approach and also participatory tools, what all are the key things? One, you know, we need coordination among uh, the communities, community institutions, and uh, PRIs, and also the public and private actors, both government and private. Uh, so then, you know, we need to have the dialogues and discussions. Uh, you know, that process uh, need to uh, take place. You need to establish better linkages among water resources managers uh, and you know the users. Uh, the efficient use and judicious, equitable use, also regulated use. In that sense, uh, we need to establish that. Then we need to have a proper management and uh, uh, you know, harvesting of uh, rainwater. We need to look at surface water, groundwater, and also uh, household and uh, community level water resources. Then, uh, uh, safety of sanitation structures and processes is quite important as part of uh, the, you know, we need to establish this uh, as part of the uh, climate change preparedness and mitigation measures. And then, uh, uh, <clears throat> there is one uh, reputation here so i'm not uh, going into sorry so that was not removed so then uh, uh, recycle and re re reusing of the water to enhance productivity uh, of water and then uh, <clears throat> we need to also ensure that uh, conservation and protection of the water bodies uh, spe specifically in the urban areas also in rural areas and the liquid waste management related to that the gray water uh, waste is not uh, going to the water bodies and contaminating it and then finally, developing and strengthening various institutional arrangements and uh, processes uh, for supporting these activities at the village level. So this is the broad requirement. Uh, the details are there. I'm not going into that. We are developing a document wherein you know all the details of this are further worked out. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> so then, uh, what sector organizations? What are uh, you know their roles in establishing or achieving this? One is. First of all, like Kamula has uh, you know, said about uh, what we are doing with the various locations in India, seven locations in India, we need to really develop across India uh, on various uh, geographical and climatical and cultural contexts, all the various uh, uh, contexts, we need to understand a very clear understanding of uh, water related climate vulnerability, water related, sanitation related, and wherever hygiene is applicable, hygiene related. And then, uh, uh, what is the kind of direct or indirect impacts of that uh, about access and uh, livelihoods and also resources and supplies? All this we need to understand from the climate change lens. And then uh, based on this understanding, we need to uh, plan a kind of potential preventive actions which should be integrated with the ongoing wash action. It's not a standalone action that I'm suggesting. So uh, all, you know, this should be equitable and uh, sustainable manner with reference to various wash programs. So all the various programs which are going on at the community level, all the new program that the civil society is initiating, how to make it uh, based on this understanding, building in and integrating the climate uh, you know, understanding in that. And then mainstreaming the climate change lens into all areas of what action by way of capacity building, multi-sectoral integration approach, keeping the PRIs at the center, and uh, conducting dialogues between various actors and various types uh, <clears throat> of actors and various levels of actors. I mean, this is quite important. There are types of actors and there are levels of actors. We need to involve all of them. And uh, then ensuring and augmenting uh, generation of local data, not from a top-down approach of monitoring, but from a local use perspective of uh, data. This is quite missing. When we were trying to prepare the paper, one of the major realization is that unless and until civil society initiates, we will not have proper data for any of these things. So civil society has a major role because I am not uh, thinking that in the current way, uh, unless the civil society and uh, people are initiating data, the accountability of the uh, administrative structures are there. We should stand for it. But you know, the history is uh, suggesting that uh, we will have to also parallelly develop uh, data. And then uh, finally, development and use of technology to leverage these processes. 
and uh, coordination support to the state actors uh, at various levels and finally research and advocacy both for uh, program design changes policy changes guideline changes etc and also for financing so this is something that we need to ensure as the uh, you know uh, what sector uh, civil society organizations agenda so based on this we are uh, trying to develop a framework and on each of that component of that framework sub components of action how to do that that kind of a framework we are developing and uh, for that if we have to ensure that there are some conditions that we need to ensure that is what is the last slide about so one is existing a new policies and schemes uh, on what should emphasize immediate as well as long term uh, climate change uh, connections on that and uh, significant investment in learning and innovation is needed uh, for the uh, both education on climate uh, integrated wash and also on behavior change related to climate integration and wash and then we need to uh, ensure that uh, uh, climate uh, change induced uh, multi hazard perspective uh, we need to have in wash program components whether it is disaster management whether it is uh, various other initiatives we need to bring in that and uh, uh, promoting a bottom up approach uh, pertaining to water and climate change and finally data uh, real time it and gis based uh, kind of uh, data systems we will have to initiate and then uh, every point in water policy decision making we need to include climate change perspective there and uh, <clears throat> identifying protecting and supporting vulnerable geographies and populations are very important so we need to have measures for that and financing is uh, one of the other important condition and finally uh, <clears throat> we, we will have to for the civil society the last point is about civil society for the civil society also there need to be sufficient funding for cli climate centered watch action so this is where uh, this uh, kind of a framework can be operationalized so with this i think uh, we have covered uh, the uh, you know outer layer of or or the uh, macro details of what should be done the micros are missing uh, the micros needs to be added uh, but you know that we can probably add while uh, through some workshops or you know some action oriented workshops in the future i hope you know this discussion uh, would have uh, you know given some uh, you know understanding of how the climate change could be ground based rather than uh, you know temperature based and how can we uh, you know reorient the wash action from the climate change premises and how to change the narrative and how to shift the paradigm uh, we probably have some ideas to begin with we hope and thank you so much I would like to thank uh, Mr. V. R. Raman for sending this uh, recorded uh, presentation. Uh, that was the end of the first session uh, for today's program. Now, uh, moving on to the next uh, session, we have our distinguished expert is Sri Ranjan Panda. Sri Panda is convener at Water Initiatives, Orissa. So, uh, sir is with us. So, uh, he is going to uh, be in be with us in a short while. Uh, to, so, till the time you wait for him, uh, maybe uh, Sri Tikender Ji, if uh, you are here, uh, probably you can uh, share some words, sir. Ms. Panda is not there. Sorry. Sir, he is joining. He is joining with us. So I think he's going to take some more time, two, three minutes. Yes. No, I think I'll wait. Uh, I mean, uh, we do not have any fillers right now. I mean, is there, or can we take some Q&As? Probably I'll just uh, run sure, sir. Q&As. Yeah, that will be better. Yeah, go ahead. Dr. Sangeeta Saxena ji is asking, safe water and uh, climate change go hand in hand to make I think there is some mistake here. How can uh, how can we make things less vulnerable and how can we save lives? If there is a connection between uh, water and climate change and it goes hand in hand, so her question is how uh, how can we uh, work towards the betterment in order to like uh, save water? I think that is the question. I think. Uh... Uh, there is a very alarming uh, picture that has come up very recently. Oh, Pandaji is there. Let, let's let's. Uh, 
We welcome you, sir, to this program. Kindly take over the session. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Soravi. I'm sorry, I just, I think I was just on time. I uh, had some issues with my internet. So, uh, yeah. Thanks for inviting me to this uh, uh, training program. And, uh, you know, as uh, as everybody knows, you know, this is more about uh, water harvesting and uh, uh, all the experiences India has is very vast. And uh, of course, you know, with its 10 uh, geoecological regions, India has, uh, you know, different kind of experiences and issues and challenges. So what I will uh, try to do within this time frame provided to me is actually, uh, uh, to take you to uh, a bit to the general issues, the larger issues, and uh, you know uh, what makes uh, water harvesting so important for Indian context or uh, or local context wherever you are in India, and then we'll give some examples from uh, uh, you know our direct uh, interventions, uh, just a couple of examples to uh, tell you that you know there is hope. Uh, and uh, then maybe we can uh, end up in some discussion points. Yeah, thank you. Can you please? Uh, yeah, this is uh, this is very general statistics, and I think each time we talk about water, any aspects of it, uh, we need to get reminded. Uh, you know, sometimes these slides are very repetitive, but I am sure very useful because. Uh, we get intergenerational audiences, and it is always, uh, you know, important to keep us reminded that you know what is, uh, you know, the blue planet that we call ourselves, you know, how, you know, uh, what what exactly is it, and uh, you know how are we placed uh, for for the life that we are blessed with uh, on this planet. So it's like, you know, if uh, Earth was the size of a basketball, for example, all of its water would fit into a ping pong ball, actually. So that is uh, that is exactly what we have uh, for, uh, at our disposal. So uh, in, in a blue planet, we should not be very proud. Uh, you know, while we should be very proud to uh, be human beings being alive, uh, and uh, uh, actually, we have this uh, this much of water, so it's rough, roughly 326 million cubic miles or uh, 1.332 billion cubic kilometers. So some 72 percent of Earth is covered in water, definitely, but 97 percent of that is salty ocean water and not suitable for drinking. And if the Earth was an apple, the water layer would be actually thinner than the fruit skin. So it's like, uh, you know, just for the common, uh, common person's, you know, imagination. And Earth's fresh water is even there. Like that was a water we can still use, but the fresh water we have is still there. Please, uh, please save the slide, please. Yeah. And, you know, 70% of fresh water is locked in ice caps. Less than 1% of the world's fresh water is readily accessible. Uh, only six countries, you know, Brazil, Russia, Canada, Indonesia, China, and Cambodia have 50% of the world's fresh water reserves. So, you know, while you have water, like something that in, uh, you know, we are experiencing nowadays due to climate change, you know, the spatial and, uh, you know, temporal variations, uh, you know, ingrained are these variations in the world historically, geographically, and only these six countries have actually 50% uh, of the total uh, fresh water reserve that we see. It's like many times uh, we talk about the blue planet, but actually this is the reality. 
So there is much more fresh water stored in the ground than there is in liquid form on the surface. So that is where we, uh, the most compatible place to use water is the surface and which of course we have uh, almost raped. Uh, we have been raping the surface, earth's surface and uh, destroying the ecosystems and actually not really concerned about uh, the kind of damages it is doing to our water resources. The visible water, in fact, uh, uh, fresh water on the surface is the visible water. You must have uh, uh, been, you know, uh, exposed to the, uh, the last World Water Day and it was invisible water, the ground water. So, uh, you know, uh, uh, that, is, that is how the situation is. So we, we just don't value, we just don't value the water that we have and we keep on extracting, you know, abusing, please. Uh, so these are some of the uh, ways that actually the earth is moving. Uh, earth in this, I always say is, you know, earth has its own, uh, you know, resilience. We, we actually don't have to uh, worry about that. What human beings are, what should be worried is actually we are linked to Earth. Our, our, and this is the only planet. There is no planet B, and you know we are, uh, we are actually we cannot survive without water, without the ecosystem services. Earth, uh, Earth's different uh, components actually provide us. So what, uh, you know, and 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 we should also always understand that what situation we are in, how we have been actually. Uh, faring in our uh, the so-called uh, uh, you know uh, tag uh, uh, you know brains uh, species with brains. So what the species with brains have done and uh, this, uh, uh, you know how situations have gone so far is like uh, as of uh, 2010, almost one third of the world's population lived in water stressed countries, defined as a country's ratio of water consumption to water availability. So you must have heard a lot about, you know, the zero day in, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, various places nowadays in Chennai, in uh, Sao Paulo, in, you know, in, in many places. So I think uh, the zero days are coming. So as, as I said, it's like uh, the variability is much. It's not constant everywhere. So countries leveled as moderate to high stress uh, water actually they consume 20 percent more water than their available supply so where there is water uh, we tend to exploit it more we tend to use it more so where there is a stress uh, you know it uh, there also uh, the situation is uh, we keep on extracting and uh, uh, we keep on moving towards uh, more water guzzling uh, uh, you know industries more water guzzling lifestyles so like you, you must have seen the situation in India, you know, uh, uh, with with uh, linking of canals, rivers, water from, for example, Narmada can be brought to Rajasthan to uh, produce, uh, uh, make it the second highest, uh, uh, you know, wheat producing uh, center. So I think we, we just don't uh, understand that, you know, there are uh, geoecological uh, you know, uh, and you know, conditions that water has been in and that should be respected. But then this is how we treat water. So as of uh, 2019, then after nine years, 17 countries in total were actually facing extremely high water stress. And these 17 nations are home to nearly one quarter of the world's population, around 1.7 billion people with India housing the lion's share, approximately 1.37 billion. So you can understand uh, the kind of situation we are in. So out of the uh, 17 nations, actually we are uh, the major nation that, the, uh, where the most of the population are actually uh, living in extremely high, uh, uh, you know, high water stress. You, you must have seen women walking uh, kilometers for water, and, and there are many invisible water scenarios which we cannot actually, uh, because we are being supplied gradually, the increase of water supply through tapes is, uh, uh, is happening. So we, we, we tend to forget 
that the sources are extremely stressed and uh, you know our water journey uh, uh, over, you know over the peat or you know over the pipes is actually getting longer so cities are now getting water from far off places like delhi uh, trying to build or building dams in himachal hyderabad getting uh, water from hundreds of kilometers so you know if we just uh, we, we're just going uh, far away from our places to get water so there's that there's a lot of there's a lot of conflicts in that so huge amount of water stress we actually visualize please so, uh, next slide so this is just a uh, just uh, just a map you can see uh, the region high stress areas uh, in 2004 and you can see the change in in the next slide uh, please so this is 2014 so you know see the extreme really high areas are increasing so just uh, uh, extremely high stress as, as i said is you know more than 80% uh, uh, you know challenges means you know it's extremely high stress areas so we are almost like high stress 40 to 80% most of india and uh, next uh, next slide please and this is how it is going to be uh, in 2040 things things might actually have changed uh, from uh, from when these maps were actually drawn so uh, there there could be much uh, much more precarious a situation and uh, uh, you know climate because climate change uh, you can see the kind of uh, you know temperature rise uh, that we, we visualize now uh, the rainfall extremes and uh, uh, dis disturbances in uh, uh, the precipitation rhythm the patterns so uh, holding water is actually getting very difficult because of uh, uh, because of the uh, rainfall variability the and and you know uh, the kind of uh, changes we see in the uh, you know climate conditions next slide please so it's like water water going away and global consumption of water is doubling every 20 years more than twice the rate of human population growth so that's not sustainable for sure uh today 1.42 billion people including 450 million children live in areas of high or extremely high water vulnerability and by the year uh, 2025 the demand for fresh water expected to rise to almost 56% above what currently available water can de deliver if, if if the kind of trend that persists continue uh so in in fact water risk is a syst systemic material risk that is causing significant economic socio cultural and ecological costs right now from supply chain disruptions unleashed by climate fueled uh, flooding and droughts to water and food insecurity caused by dwindling water supply so not uh, not a single aspect of our life uh, is actually going to be as uh, you know as it was so everything is going to be disturbed and the kind of uh, flooding and the kind of droughts you see together is actually uh, causing a lot of issues we, we we will come to that how how difficult it has become to actually harvest water to recharge ground water and actually to uh, maintain the kind of food uh, chain that we we used to have so kind of lot of projections are coming which are uh, which are actually disturbing which are uh, actually leading us to a disastrous future it's already already wreaking havoc on uh, lives of billions of uh, you know vulnerable communities next slide please so the in india it's like we have a poor percent of world's water resources statistically i must say and among all rivers of india 12 are classified as major rivers which are catching about uh, 253 million hectare of catchment area and 46 as medium rivers with 24.6 million hectare of catchment areas the, the gange brahmaputra meghna system is the largest river system in india and of course in the uh, entire you know uh, you know himalayan region is largest river system in india with 43% of the catchment area of all major river systems the other major river systems are indus sabarmati mahi narmada tapi uh, brahmani mahanadi godavari krishna pennar and kaveri 
Apart from that, there are several other medium river systems of which uh, Subarna Rekha with 1.9 million hectare catchment area is the largest. And other than rivers and canals, other inland water resources include numerous reservoirs, tanks, and ponds, bills, oxbow lakes, you know, derelict water and brackish water, which cover almost 7 million hectares of area. So these are all important. Uh, why I'm trying to bring your notice to this is uh, we are killing almost all of them. Actually, these are the systems that, that link us, uh, you know, to life. To uh, If they are alive, if they have a right to life, then we'll have a right to life. We'll have a right to water, which is already recognized by the UN system. And uh, uh, you, we as individuals have right to life, right to water. Uh, but then, uh, you know, human right to water cannot sustain only, unless, you know, rivers have right, uh, right to live. As, as you know, human beings, unless, unless all these water bodies have a right to live, you know, as we have. So I think, and, and uh, these are all important connects uh, between us and, uh, you know, monsoon, for example, we, we, we will come to that. So we, we just cannot, as we cannot ignore monsoon rainfall, uh, we cannot ignore these kind of structures, uh, which are very important to, uh, you know, harvest uh, monsoon rainfall and keep, keep those for uh, all, all year along, for all our uses. So uh, that, that's why these are very important. And they, but they are, you know, all these water bodies and all that I said, they're unevenly distributed over the country with Odisha, Andhra Pradesh, Gujarat, Karnataka, and West Bengal possessing more than 50% of these inland water resources. So it's like, uh, you know, the sea is not usable. We know the inland water resources, the fresh water resources are very vital for our survival, our economy uh, to actually flourish and all the socio-economic and cultural uh, you know, uh, lives that we live, uh, cultures uh, that thrive. So we, we, we also have, to, uh, we don't have a, uh, you know, even distribution of these resources anyways. And, and, but of course, everywhere, uh, you know, uh, socio-economic and cultural aspects have actually been groomed by these water resources. Civilizations have survived and uh, been developed on uh, river basins, and uh, cultures have thrived on uh, water bodies. So I think I think these are very important uh, aspects. Yeah, please. And now, as I said, monsoon is our actually lifeline, and that is where the entire concept of water harvesting comes. Like catch water where it falls is something a slogan we heard from our gurus like. You know, Anil Agarwal from the CSE and Anupam Misraji, who, who were the champions in India and, and many uh, local, uh, you know, heroes. They have been the champions for uh, centuries. So I think uh, uh, why monsoon is so important. Monsoon, in fact, I, I used to say, you know, uh, you have to uh, respect monsoon if you actually respect your life uh, in India. If you respect, uh, if you expect your economy to grow, uh, so it's 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 everything. Uh, so monsoon precipitation has been the lifeline of India with respect to agriculture as well as recharging its water resources. India receives about 4,000 billion cubic meter of average annual precipitation along with snowfall of which 3,000 BCM is received in the monsoon season alone. So that's June to September. And the spatial distribution of precipitation widely varies. That's that's the worry, and that's why we don't see the similar kind of uh, you know water availability structures and you know and uh, lifestyles and uh, cropping patterns. So we don't we don't see uniform styles everywhere because uh, there are there are sp spatial distribution, uh, you know uh, of uh, you know uh, the spatial uh, spatial distribution widely varies. So somewhere in Rajasthan, it's like less than 100 millimeter. Uh, in, in Assam, it's like more than 2,500 uh, millimeter. So between these, you, you have uh, Cherapunji, you have uh, Odisha, and you have many other places. So, uh, and there are, there are you know, places in Gujarat, there are places in Rajasthan, all these receive very less rainfall. So less than 50% of the total precipitation flows 
to the rivers and it is estimated as 1869 bcm however only 690 bcm surface water resources can actually be utilized so uh, so you see uh, the amount of rain we receive we cannot utilize them because it, it there are there are many factors that determines how much water we can actually hold it depends on how much structures we have uh, depends on you know what kind of vegetation cover we have where the water falls uh, so that uh, you know the percolation happens to ground water depends on the kind of heat uh, you know that uh, that the geography experiences so that uh, you know the evaporation uh, uh, le uh, level is uh, you know uh, the kind of you know evaporation level that is there and and many other factors so so we we cannot actually uh, use all the waters that we see please next slide and uh, something very important that we see india being you know the uh, the largest ground extractor of ground water in the world so and uh, uh, our surface water bodies are uh, the conduit to actually recharge ground water along with forests and of course uh, the soil uh, you know so ground water is a replenishable but highly stressed resource we know that agriculture industrial and domestic sectors majorly depend on ground water annual utilizable ground water resources in india is estimated almost 433 billion cubic meter the main source of ground water is a recharge from monsoon pre precipitation and that is where lies the key uh, when we are talking about water harvesting when we are talking about the surface water bodies that we will uh, come in uh, future slides you know uh, that is that is exactly why uh, you know water harvesting is very important so you do it uh, uh, with artificial recharge you do it with uh, natural recharge uh, the, the spread, uh, spread effects but but then you know you must do it you just cannot uh, avoid it so about 58% of countries annual rechargeable ground water is contributed by monsoon rainfall so uh, and that's exactly you know we are worried at the moment because uh, uh, you know the uh, uh, the climate climate change impacts are in, in fact you know disturbing the monsoon patterns and and that also is making uh, you know water harvesting and recharge much more difficult then other sources of recharge seepage from canals tanks ponds and other water structures and you know irrigation account for for about 32% so there are also new ways <clears throat> nowadays of uh, recharging ground water so uh, but then everything is linked <clears throat> sorry linked to monsoon and without uh, uh, a proper mon without harvesting monsoon water properly we just cannot uh, survive we just cannot uh, make our ground uh, ground water uh, uh, you know healthy both in quality and quantity same with surface water uh, next slide please so uh, so this is where uh, you must have already uh, you know listened to a, a lot of experts on climate change so uh, you know special and water stress i know special variation mismatch across the nation is a big problem that that i have been saying you know while as per the international norms countries with per capita water availability, availability less than 1700 uh, you know cubic meter uh, per year is categorized as water stressed with per capita available water of 1545 cubic meter india is def definitely water stressed uh, countries uh, i think uh, studies show that the projected per capita water availability will become 1401 cubic meter and 1191 cubic meter by 2025 and uh, uh, 2050 respectively and eventually india is likely to become a water scarce country so but then but as i said there are many areas in india which are already severely water stressed it's it's not uniform so india geographical uh, you know on an average statistics it might uh, still not be called a severely water stressed country but then i think almost uh, in many places of india you see uh, water stress is actually increasing and severely uh, water stressed areas are actually growing please next slide so this is also not a very new map i think things would have changed but still i thought i to show it to you so 54% of india faces high to extremely high water stress so i think this map is uh, 
very uh, you know almost one decade old but then i think now situation has uh, hasn't improved a lot despite of many efforts uh, we are still facing and also due to climate change uh, things have become worse next slide uh, you know water actually is the climate emergency you know water is not just conditional to life but also the conduit to climate change climate change has disrupted the water cycle as we we have been discussing close to 200 districts in the country experience both flood and drought in the same season so you have extreme precipitation events you know almost 50% 40% of the entire year's average rainfall falling within 24 hours in an area then the next uh, day there is no water because all that has been uh, actually drained into the sea so 3.6 billion people across the world live in areas that witness water scarcity for at least a month in a year and uh, by 2050 this number would rise up to 5.7 billion but in india also it will be a fair share of people yeah next and this is a map i took from uh, the down to earth magazine this shows how uh, the vulnerability uh you know the cumulative vulnerability due to climate change uh, is actually going to impact and and more uh, that that makes water harvesting more so important yeah next uh, slide uh, the indian worry yeah. uh, climate change increase in mean and extreme pre precipitation of indian summer monsoon uh, see this monsoon is called basically technical terms uh, in technical terms summer monsoon so would increase in number of monsoon break days spells of sparse rainfall during mid monsoon months as i told you decline in seasonal rainfall coupled with increase in extreme pre precipitation during the monsoon will increase floods and droughts together that's what already we see and tropical cyclone related rainfall rates will increase so increase in mean tropical cyclone with maximum wind speed is likely although not projected for all tropical regions so we already see uh even summer cyclones and nowadays so we have uh, you know the cyclone seasons are growing because of uh, uh in increased uh, sea surface temperature uh, due to climate change and also we have seen a lot of uh, studies recently we says coastal flooding will increase so it means uh, actually water stress is not something that you actually only see when the quantity of water is reduced but water stress also increases where your quality of water is also uh, reduced is also uh, you know it also goes down so many many coast, coastal areas in india and elsewhere are actually going to face more quality issues because of sea rise and as uh, fresh you know saline water ingresses into uh, invades into uh, you know fresh water that is one kind of issues geological and other man made uh, quality challenges uh will also grow in many fluoride arsenic and other affected areas in india where uh, you see uh, you know water stress grows so because of less water available you know the, the 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 impact of this quality challenges will also grow so severe impact on crop yields sorghum wheat etc in indo you know gangetic plains alterations in rice yields with temperature rise are also projected we are already seeing how Uh, right at this moment many places in central india uh, farmers are yet to be able to actually uh, see a good crop so they are staring at drought and and you know all of a sudden you will see one day there will be a sort of extreme rainfall and whatever uh, crop will be there that will be damaged it happened in uh, many parts in india last year also so poor areas areas with poor infrastructure will have maximum vulnerability disease outbreaks due to temperature variations will also grow then extremely vulnerable because 33% of world's poor live here over 60% of farm is rain fed and 80% farmers are very small and marginal land holders <clears throat> so india is very much vulnerable uh, to these water stress uh, due to climate change and other factors next slide please so let me now come to odisha where i stay and where we have worked a lot so it's like a state which we call disaster capital of india out of the you know last 110 years almost 101 years have been disaster affected 
you know contrasting weather conditions a reality now after 1965 frequency and calamity struck areas is actually increasing regularly uh, next slide Uh, and drought, let me come to drought uh, the, in, in the entire central highlands, uh, including Odisha's uh, western part. Uh, you know, the other name is, uh, you know, drought. Then this region has already suffered more than 50 years of drought, mostly coming in recent years. Uh, yeah, next slide. And of course, drought is not new to western part of Odisha, uh, but the inefficiency to fight it actually is new. Because, uh, for example, uh, there is one extremely po uh, poor area in India that was termed as KBK region. The Kalahandi, Balangir, Koraput. Now these districts have been divided, but this KBK region is very was very infamous for all the kind of you know, uh, you know sale of child, you know, and kind of uh, hunger death, starvation death, and all uh, things have improved drastically. But then uh, it was. Uh, even uh, now also we can say it was economically more prosperous than almost all the regions of central provinces earlier. And uh, why? Because, uh, because of the web of traditional water harvesting structures, uh, which actually made it agriculturally prosperous. So um, uh, people here actually understood this very fact that now we are talking that, you know, catch water where it falls. And you have to actually, uh, you know, harvest rainwater uh, during the monsoon uh, for, for managing it properly uh, th throughout the entire year. So uh, that made uh, this area, actually, it is also said that during the Bengal famine also, uh, you know, excessive food grain was supplied from this area to, to the famine impacted areas. So now a region which is known as drought prone almost uh, regularly, was actually an agriculturally prosperous area uh, thanks to uh, thanks to water harvesting culture uh, please uh, what actually happened we must understand uh, you know understanding rainwater harvesting and the policies uh, we should also understand you know uh, why india actually came to this uh, this pass and why uh, regions like the western belt of odisha in the central highlands actually came to this because after independence, uh, uh, you know, we did not recognize the traditional practices anymore. Even, even uh, when the Britishers came and uh, uh, the concrete engineering, uh, you know, dominated the uh, water management for policies and practices. So I think uh, the local practices were not recognized. So people lost their own faith on their own systems and, and uh, knowledge. And that's the region, uh, and and there are also legal things. Many community structures were transferred to government. Then uh, uh, attention shifted to large and medium modern irrigation projects, including big dams. So it was thought that you know the government will uh, make some big dam somewhere and provide water everywhere. So people were uh, sort of uh, people thought there was no need to actually have these structures anymore. So many rich farmers, because the land, uh, uh, you know, uh, land ownership is very skewed in uh, in many parts of India, uh, because as, as I told you, 80% of farmers are actually small and marginal and older. The la rest of the land is actually with big landlords in many parts, including this KVK area. So many of these rich farmers, they earlier they had uh, actually generously uh, uh, made uh, this kind of water bodies for all people to be benefited. But when the government took over, when they realized that the, uh, there were ceiling and other kind of provisions also in the land laws, so they thought that you know many, many of our these uh, things which were known as community structures uh, will be taken over by the government. So why, why lose our own land uh, when the government has already come and independent India in independent India and government is supposed to provide water to everyone. So kind of a lot of these kind of factors also impacted and uh, uh, many, many of them converted tanks into agricultural uh, lands. Then, uh, then deforestation also happened uh, rapidly and uh, starting from the British period where the coop and other things were also organized as you might have known 
uh, one of their policies was to uh, you know uh, deforest uh, and uh, and and earn revenue and take away a lot of these uh, or railways and other things so many of these catchment areas were also impacted so uh, basically over the period due to all these regions a sustainable system and culture actually eroded next uh, slide so but then rain has not failed us as i said uh, in in this part of uh, in this part of the country it's like uh, we still receive uh, 1200 to 1400 uh, mm of rainfall on an average so the, uh, like in in some parts it's like 1472 mm so uh, unlike rajasthan where you have 232 mm of rainfall here it's like almost 14 more than 1400 so this 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 districts also the kbk uh, you know districts they also receive much more rainfall than the agriculturally well of punjab earlier uh, data also says the rain never failed us we have failed ourselves and invited drought us by not caring for our tanks and traditional water harvesting systems so historically the neglect of uh, the the traditional knowledge and practices like now it is everybody says you know rooftop water harvesting and all i think while these are all important uh, the the surface water bodies uh, by far remains the most important and why you know uh, largest uh, uh, you know systems to actually harvest rain water and recharge ground water uh, of course after fulfilling a lot of needs of the communities local communities and and of course ecology next slide please so tanks as i said were an integral part of our culture in in western parts of odisha almost every village has a network of tanks given the nature of the landscape the design of all these earthen tanks was or is appropriate for raining uh, you know retaining surface water for you that is very important actually tanks for example is not a universal site so it's like uh, people were knowledgeable enough they had the uh, skills Uh, to build tanks according uh, to the geographies uh, you know uh, to the topography so and and the soil types and that's why they were very successful uh, it's not because just you dig anywhere like uh, some of some places we see in recent schemes also including the uh, manerga uh, is that you know you just dig a pond anywhere you because you have uh, a scheme you have a scheme but then that doesn't work because many many places because of the soil types and because of uh, uh, you know other factors uh, many many structures don't hold water but traditionally uh, you know uh, there there were communities like the kultas who actually migrated to the area around later half of the 18th century and early 19th, 19th century and they were expert tank diggers and brought with them the unique design of tank building and they they actually understood as i said uh, the the flow of water monsoon water and uh, and and then what kind of structure to be dug where uh, depending on the geography of the villages villages were directly managing this with institutions like jal sabhas or water assembly nowadays we see the pani panchayats and all uh, that's a different story we will talk some other time but then earlier also people had because these were the most important uh, you know uh, things that they possessed and without water no no civilization could actually prosper next uh, slide so these are uh, protecting the structures through forest protection in catchment area was part of the social system see that is very important nowadays in many many cities you see uh, we are actually reviving or we are trying to revive wa water bodies but then the catchments are gone because uh, they have been encroached for buildings markets and other things like ponds themselves water bodies themselves have been encroached but wherever they have not been encroached and they are being uh, you know efforts are uh, on to actually protect them or revive them the catchments are gone because uh, many, many places it, it is the catchment which actually brings the water it's not only the rainfall that actually fills these are not these are not concrete tanks so these are basically ecosystem because they are they are built on a particular kind of soil and uh, uh, you know at, at a particular area of the geography and the, uh, their catchment is very important so one thing is for sure that many of the water bodies that uh, that still exist 
many in many parts of the country they, their catchment is gone but then in these uh, uh, twhs that we studied and we worked on uh, in western parts of odisha uh, in central highlands is actually earlier people were protecting as a as a part of the social system they would not destroy the catchment area but till 1950s you know there is evidence that people built tanks with community contribution on a large scale after that the government took over it was decided that the government will do everything so this community uh, system uh, com- contribution system also vanished so you know the ownership uh, in in a way also vanished so i think uh, or degraded so i think that is that is where a lot of problems lie using elaborate systems of you know these are different kind of structures i am i am not going to details but these all uh, mudas katas chahlas bans chuas uh, these are kind of structures and there are many sir and and uh, there are many kind of structures that that we have we find still we find some uh, some in relics and some is active so and and some already vanished so i think uh, they were uh, you know able to irrigate there we have made some comparison like Uh, this is not very fresh but then uh, during our study uh, you know uh, in in only one district according to a survey the irrigation coverage has gone down from 52% in 1950 to 20% at present so it's like earlier with uh, of course population and other uh, uh, factors are there that has not been integrated but you know uh, the, the percentage of irrigation just one indicator uh, if you see only one indicator Uh, due to the degradation of uh, these water bodies uh, and due to the dependence on uh, the uh, the irrigation facilities provided uh, like uh, in in some pockets only so i think uh, the irrigation percentage has gone down drastically so that is what uh, the damage has been done uh, to this extent next so there are many causes as i said uh, it's not only the uh, government change and, and you know uh, the change of guards um, but then deforestation has led uh, to the, uh, then uh, larger concentration on flow irrigation as i said uh, attention uh, is more on flow irrigation so these are actually in many places uh, irrigation uh, survival sustenance irrigation actually in many of these things because we are in tropical dry deciduous areas where actually temperatures go up and many tanks would not actually be holding water during summer but then they have the necess- you know many of them would be having minimum water uh, necessary moisture content and and uh, uh, sufficient to provide uh, you know su- sustain uh, some of the crops during uh, during monsoon uh, during the kharif and also in some places some alternative crops not not paddy uh, during rabi uh, uh, you know then societal issues as i said uh, there could be several kind of issues the lack of interest in carrying forward the traditional knowledge the young generation basically is no more interested in uh, this kind of uh, knowledge systems or uh, tank digging has become a machine act of machine and uh, local knowledge uh, is uh, that we have failed in actually integrating uh, technology and uh, uh, traditions in many parts we are basically revival is being tried at the moment by some uh, you know sectors by some actors but then uh, still it's very very small and effort so change in farming systems and methods because of uh, a lot of emphasis on after green revolution a lot of emphasis on you know water guzzling uh, water intensive uh, farming systems uh, these traditional systems were actually uh, they they were not leading to water intensive crops they were uh, you know uh, like paddy would be the staple but then uh, there will be the other uh, there will be crop di- uh, diversification which actually now got mono uh, the monoculture was uh, basically promoted in most parts after green revolution after flow irrigation was provided so these are also some of the issues that led to the degradation yeah next slide Uh, but then there are hopes there have been efforts this is uh, this is something uh, we uh, uh, you know is bijapur kota it's a large water body of 250 acres it was actually built early uh, 1800 uh, to be specific by 18 18 uh, 
by the local landlord uh, he, he actually tried to shift the entire village to an area where he built a water body because uh, the earlier village they were staying did not have any water so he decided uh, to bring uh, you know uh, uh, pond diggers from outside who who basically found out a place where water will be actually there will be proper water uh, if we we dig a tank so this is one uh, example uh, this village was settled around it this is now lifeline of thousands of villagers and in fact the identity of this village called bizepur in odisha then it still provides uh, 500 to 1000 acres of uh, you know irrigation through two canals and during ravi uh, this is during kharif and during ravi 150 acres so after that you know the structures is very unique they are you know it 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 uh, harvests water from a traditional uh, you know from a perennial uh, uh, stream so that uh, that is harvested and then left uh, uh, down streams so there are several uh, 20 to 25 check dams below which then leads to further irrigation and other uh, you know uh, uh, benefits downstream for five uh, four to five villages so then uh, this structure was also in a highly degraded uh, uh, you know condition in 2009 the women decided to agitate uh, you know and revive this so after a struggle of almost 7 years uh, they managed to find government attention and uh, almost you know 3 Three crore or some rupees were sanctioned, and this uh, this was then revived. Revived, and now it is an again a flourishing uh, you know water body, uh, which is very large and which still has uh, a lot of benefits for the people. So this is one example that we can say hope. Then there is a smaller structure. The next slide, please. Then then I will take you to a smaller structure, which is again one of the examples. I said it was built by local royal family actually. In in the 1940s, so that's a five, seven acre structure, but there is a unique uh, 13 acre structure built around it called the uh, another. Uh, uh, this is bun. This is a pond, uh, four side four side closed. But then the arcata is like something very parallel to that. So uh, so it's like almost a 20 acre area. Uh, it was uh, at that point of time it was only meeting drinking water need. That's very important to understand. you know uh, there were there are villages where we have 28 structures all together and uh, earlier you know there are socio cultural uh, needs being met by different uh, structures so so we have uh, cultures where you know there will be a pond for the gobi there will be pond for uh, the cattle uh, there will be pond for only women there will be pond for these there will be pond for that there will be pond for drinking so kind of people had uh, in many places these were um, made in different you know for different purposes depending on uh, the geography and socio socio cultural you know uh, realities of those areas of course there are uh, you know things like caste systems also determining the kind of uh, ponds and uses uh, you know that that was also part of the history and uh, uh, but then uh, at the end of it uh, you know the, the the positive side is people harvested water and they had to and they 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 depended on their traditional knowledge and uh, and that that came actually handy that that was very much successful in many parts so this also uh, this pond is still irrigating 100 acres of farmland at the moment no drinking water no more because other sources have come up uh, the government for supplies and and tube wells and all but still it meets bathing needs of uh, almost 5 to 6 villages livestock also use this then uh, uh, of course there are the naming of these structures are also very important earlier whoever donated the plot uh, the you know for community use but it was actually built by a landlord uh, a local royal family landlord and uh, they they named it after uh, their uh, he named it uh, after his wife then there are unique unique uh, uh, you know knowledge was applied depending on the geography as i said this uh, this arcata is not something you find with every structure uh, but for, for this geography it was unique and it was needed so uh, that that i said you know depending on the geographical location they they built different kind of structures 
So then uh, what is important is the grandson actually, who is a retired uh, uh, principal of a college, uh, college. he decided uh, recently to revive this. This was also degraded and uh, he, he revived this. He, he, he spent money to clean this up with help of the local people. Then he also uh, has encouraged catchment plantation also. So that uh, they, these are hopes and uh, uh, there are several government schemes, including uh, Manerga, that is also, you know, uh, reviving a lot of uh, water bodies. So uh, definitely uh, that's going to serve the purpose, but uh, please next slide. Yeah, so, so these are the lessons that we think uh, we should learn from these kind of examples and these kind of knowledge systems. So traditional knowledge and practices are still valid. We cannot actually ignore them. And decentralized water resource man management is actually the key to ensure water security and build climate resilience. So these kind of structures uh, catch water where it falls. The principle itself is decentralization. You cannot actually harvest water somewhere only centrally and then distribute. Rain itself is a distributory mechanism and it it, it is a decentralized uh, distribution mechanism. So it, it falls everywhere. So if it falls everywhere, you have to harvest it everywhere. So, and if you are going to do that, I think uh, uh, that is exactly uh, what is needed. And that is where these traditional knowledge and practices uh, are very key. Uh, you, you just cannot have everything concretized, everything, you know, this concrete structure, centralized structures, people's knowledge, has to, has to be brought into action. Then crop diversification and capacity building of local self governments and people's organization is very much needed because we have seen and we have seen our own work experiences. Once you have harvested water, water security has been achieved. People tend to go for the crops that fetch actually money. And that's where most of these crops are actually water intensive. So there are a lot of conflicts grow. Then the same thing, uh, the same ob objective is defeated. So I think that is that is how crop diversification and a lot of other integrated actions are very much you know required. Then climate action plans need to integrate traditional water harvesting structures. So each state has its climate action plan. Some states are now trying to decentralize those as well, go down to district level. So and and further, I think this this must be the part. Uh, there are several green, green climate fund projects who are which are actually trying to integrate these. So I think why not integrate all this in your local plan so that anytime you get some resources, you can manage some resources, you try to revive them. So, and don't, don't let them die in any case, neither in, uh, you know, no water body should be uh, actually now destroyed anymore, uh, both in urban and rural areas. So technology intervention needed in schemes, including uh, Manerga. See, what, what I said is uh, many places in, in Manerga also we have seen uh, that you know they have just dug uh, dug these pits and uh, ponds, but then uh, it 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 ain't holding water as much as it should. So there are certain technologies available uh, which which can actually tell you which soil will have uh, you know which soil type and which place of the geography. Earlier use people use their traditional knowledge, their experience with the geography, but now there are also technologies available. So people's knowledge and uh, new technology can be actually uh, intervened both and, and uh, made these structures more successful. And community owned and managed systems are more sustainable. So wherever you are planning water harvesting systems and structures, uh, let the community uh, you know, be part of it. Like in Jaljiban mission also, you know, source sustainability is a very key aspect. Uh, and and there are many uh, many places like I have also been part of some training programs for them and uh, we have we have always emphasized that you know uh, when you are talking about source sustainability try to uh, see that the people are engaged from the planning level itself and they are part they they own the process so you know whatever uh, capacity building need is required you you do that. But then because they are going to stay, not, not, not any government officer is actually going to stay in a village. Uh, the villagers only themselves will stay. So if you actually make them to own the process from the beginning, beginning starting from planning to implementation to monitoring and evaluation to maintenance, regular maintenance, I think uh, uh, 
that is only where you actually build in sustainability to a system. Uh, next slide. So uh, benefits of all these, uh, these are just some benefits I have listed out. You must have already heard from other experts. Surface water, you, you bring in surface water security, you bring in groundwater recharge, you can address the imbalances in water supply and demand by conjunct conjunctive use. That is something we very much prescribe everywhere. Don't use one source uh, for any purpose, neither drinking water nor the other things. So if you actually have decentralized water harvesting systems and structures, you can actually fulfill your many of your needs. Like some structures could be very useful during some part, uh, in some geographies, some places, during some times, and for some purposes. So you make a plan in every village, in every water set, uh, you know, of uh, conjunctive use actually. And, and uh, water harvesting uh, is very important in that. Then restoring, uh, protecting aquifers, uh, there are many ways, even as I said, you know, the, uh, the managed uh, aquifer recharge. Now, earlier we called them artificial recharging, but nowadays, uh, you know, new studies have come up. Uh, these are being called uh, managed aquifer, you know, recharge, M-A-R. So you take the M-A-R principles and, uh, and, and, you know, once you uh, recharge, once you revive these water bodies and these surface water bodies, then you are actually recharging the aquifers as well as the, uh, the surface, the higher surface aquifers. The uh, you know then uh, re rejuvenating rivers and streams, minimum flow maintenance. At least like in many places, uh, these are linked to the local uh, local springs and local uh, you know rivers, local streams. So once you recharge these, uh, you also you are also recharging the uh, the streams and the springs and rivers downstream. So there have been examples. Then soil moisture retention uh, is uh, is also improved, and that that also leads to a lot of pastoral land development because many places there have been scientific studies. If you are actually properly uh, doing uh, water harvesting, uh, re reviving water harvesting in water sets, then a lot of uh, barren-looking lands could actually develop as pastoral lands. The grasslands, the uh, grasses, and all they actually come up because of the uh, moisture and and you can actually manage your uh, pastoral requirements very well uh, if, if you are actually trying to do that. Then, uh, of course, uh, water bodies are also flood protection measures. They absorb your, uh, these extreme precipitation events, uh, ex extra flow, they absorb them and, and let the rest actually flow. So you have, if you have water bodies, if you have surface water bodies, uh, you can, and, and you, you see many of the cities nowadays uh, they are actually experiencing flash floods because they, they have encroached upon their wetlands and water bodies. So, you know, the water has no place to go and, uh, you know, sustain or survive, uh, you know, uh, uh, settle. So, uh, so that's why you see a lot of flash floods. So similarly, uh, the, one of the major, uh, you know, benefits you get from protecting water bodies, wetlands and all is actually flood protection from, uh, from the currently extreme uh, variability, rainfall variability. And, and that's why they are very, and overall, uh, they lead to ecosystem restoration because they, by, by increasing uh, the ecosystem services around, uh, they also bring in the friendly uh, and healthy species diversity into the water bodies as well as uh, the, the, uh, the surroundings. So they overall, uh, you know, uh, develop, uh, they overall help us uh, in ecosystem restoration. So I think uh, uh, I have this much. Next slide, please. Thank you. And let's dive into water. Thanks so much. Thank you, sir, so much for your informative presentation and also very enlightening at the same time. Um, Together, sir, uh, would you like to add some comments? Oh, or I, I, move think, on? I think better we jump to the questions. Sure. Yeah. So uh, there are a few questions here. Uh, so yeah. is asking how the local authorities are playing role in preserving tanks or ponds. Okay, actually they are supposed to play the uh, you know bigger role, and uh, uh, many of these structures are actually uh, they are technically owned nowadays by the gram panchayats. 
so uh, the gram panchayats uh, should be at the center of uh, uh, recharging and managing this uh, but then when uh, it's a gram panchayat it should be the people so i think uh, somewhere we have failed down the line in many parts of india is uh, in uh, in basically reviving the community ownership of this structure so nowadays many of these schemes are uh, being promoted as uh, alien schemes you know just some development some uh, some concretization some beautification but then uh, wherever the community are involved by the uh, by the because the the fund comes through the authorities if the authorities have ma made you know special uh, taken special interest to involve communities i think uh, local communities uh, sustainability chances are more so they have of course uh, a very big role to play Dr. Swati is asking, sir, is there any success stories on water conservation intervention in Orissa? Yeah, I told you there are two two examples. I only gave you from one from Bijapur and one from Kharia, and there are hundreds of them. So we we ourselves actually, uh, I was given the first Green Hero Award by the president in 2010 because I spent almost 16 years reviving hundreds of water bodies in villages. So so there have been small and big examples. uh you know starting from local water bodies to wetlands like chilika so we have uh, many examples of course every successful example has also its uh, you know problems but then i think overall the hope is there and a lot of success has happened i think uh, we should be very hopeful shridhar ji is asking what was the conservation methods followed by the people before independence and what happened post independence mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, before independence, as I said, you know, uh, these are some, these are all traditional. Everywhere in India, you go to Rajasthan, there are different kind of structures. You go to Tamil Nadu, there are different kind of structures. You go to the Himalayas, uh, like uh, uh, there are uh, there are these springs, uh, uh, and people people have been living with those. And basically, uh, by traditional knowledge and practices, what we mean is, people have been living with a geography with natural resources. for centuries and that's how with their interaction with uh, the, those geographies they have developed a knowledge system to live with them so i think before independence or even even much before that before the britishers came so uh, there are a lot of lot of uh, efforts actually to revive the traditional water harvesting structures but with the britishers in to india uh, came the engineering the, the civil engineering uh, you know uh, uh, sort of domain so after that uh, mostly it was uh, the traditional knowledge was taken over gradually taken over by uh, modern engineering so in many places the local values eroded so i think uh, after independence uh, uh, you know our governments have worked uh, under schemes so there were uh, for example integrated rural development program water said management program soil conservation programs so every program had different components to recharge water because that was uh, that was the that was the key in bringing in all other aspects of development be it uh, far, farm produces be it your drinking water so there are in, uh, national rural drinking water project or different kind of projects so projects were uh, actually funded through schemes and with that the the planning went to basically most of the water resource departments were managed by engineers so the planning went to engineers only so i think somewhere down the line we we did not succeed in uh, you know keeping our traditional knowledge systems and practices alive uh, many places of course the structures remained and efforts were made to revive but then people's own faith on the system uh, was was not properly restored so i think but but there have been efforts there have been local ngos i have i have personally visited many places in india in himachal in you know in uttarakhand in rajasthan in odisha and madhya pradesh chatisgarh now chatisgarh as well jharkhand so there have been <clears throat> there still have been lot of initiatives uh, that are going on and uh, i would say it's a mixed bag so uh, both uh, both uh, modern engineering and traditional engineering has are still in place in india but then what i want to uh, the message that i want to bring is we need to actually uh, uh, get on to a mission mode to revive most of these traditional skills otherwise uh, we cannot sustain uh, the kind of 
impacts that we are actually facing due to climate change on our thank you sir so much for taking up all the question and uh, Sri Ranjan Panda is also known as the waterman of uh, India because of his extensive work related to uh, water. Sir, thank you for being with us and uh, involving in this very uh, fruitful uh, discussion and conversation. Thank you, sir. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks so much. Sir, if you want to make any concluding remarks, you can. Uh, no, it's okay. I think one of the things that... I now I am very much involved is how to uh, take this knowledge to the youths because the, I see a lot of intergenerational gap in uh, uh, this knowledge and practice systems. <clears throat> so something we are trying to do is actually work with the youth and mostly many urban youths are getting detached from uh, these natural ecosystems and <clears throat> you know knowledge systems uh, that have evolved around those. So something that I would like to ask everyone and request is try to get as much youth as possible uh, in building their uh, you know knowledge on these so that we can actually have a because we are actually eating of their water future we are we are a credit card generation we are we are already on uh, on a on a borrowed earth and we are already exhausted we have already exhausted the water resources of our grandchildren and and great grandchildren so we should now involve the youth who are the transitional forces uh, to actually uh, revive uh, all these water bodies. And second thing is, let your governments, uh, you know, not uh, ask your government not to turn any one, even one more water body into anything else. We need a lot of more water bodies. Every, every water body needs to be revived now. We cannot let them die anymore for whatever reason, you know for market complex, for roads, whatever. So we have to try and see that uh, we actually, we make them survive. So let us try and uh, do whatever little possible in our own at, you know, ways. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. <clears throat> Thanks. That was the end of the second session for today's program. So now moving on to the third and the last session of this training program, our distinguished expert, is Professor Arun Kumar. Professor Kumar is Professor at the Department of Hydro and Renewable Energy, Indian Institute of Technology, IIT, Roorkee. We welcome you, sir, to this program and kindly Thank take you. the session. Thank you. Uh, so good morning and good afternoon now, everybody, uh, for this last session of this three days training program, which has been extensive when we're experts on the subject of water storage and especially rainwater harvesting and etc. have been taken care of. and all the when I look at the topics uh, which have been covered by I mean the speakers I could see that uh, a wide range of climate change and uh, uh, storage and uh, rainfall uh, this uh, rainwater harvesting has been taken care of. so in my lecture which I'll try to keep it uh, in the sense brief about 30 minutes I'll speak on so another 10-15 minutes we can have text section or maybe 35 minutes I speak on that and then we can uh, discuss on that. Is it okay? Um, yes. Yes, fine. So now I'd like to share the screen in the sums of uh, that uh, which uh, uh, presentation I'd like to make it. So hope you are able to see the slide. Yes, sir. perfect. Very good. So uh, I'll be talking about the motivation, water governance and resilience for this water harvest structure, but I will take you a little bit uh, uh, the whole thing as a water use. I mean, it's a water is there. Presently, water comes by the rain and then, then it goes as a runoff uh, in the Nala River, etc. And when it's practically and some water goes into infiltration, but uh, there has been, uh, so what kind of motivation one should have to have these structures? We should not forget, though we forget that water cycle actually is the life cycle are the same, you know, in terms of it is the whole life cycle, you know, even our human nature or human life cycle is the same. So we need to forget that uh, water is a cycle and that we should remember. All of us know very well that what is in water harvesting. I need not to mention that it's basically a, uh, a system where it stores the water from the rain and very recently, Jal Jeeval Mission has brought this uh, slogan, catch the rain, you know, catch the rain. So that means you catch the rain, uh, not with the fingers, not with the, you know, your palm, but also with the, 
uh, on your roof, you catch it the, through the system and that is store it and then you use it as a uh, for productive use and this productive use can be many 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 kind of use it can have so this is a very general things which uh, all of us know very well and uh, and a need is that motivation for in what i'm saying is that we have uh, it's not that first time we had being done in the last 10 year 20 year 30 years in fact it is being done from ages you know it's from ages from the uh, uh, especially from this, you know, since humankind is there, the people catch the rain, catch the rain through the various mechanisms, like we have ponds, etc. And then metro cities or those big cities, we have very high level of groundwater extraction. It's alarming depletion of groundwater. So the idea is here, then we must try to reduce extraction of groundwater. We must try to, because groundwater is, extraction is, uh, has got many repercussions and also Concretization is late to the flooding of stormwater and so called the logging, water logging, and we are having continuous failure of monsoon many times, and there have been deficit of rainfall in some places. And when excess rain comes, it comes in too much of excess, intensity becomes quite high, and uh, even some kind of excess heat is there. So idea is here that there is a requirement of uh, the you know uh, the requirement of having the this uh, rainwater harvesting. It improves water quality. Groundwater, if you put it into uh, the ground as aquifer, then also ground recharging, soil erosion, especially during when you have a high intensity of rain, it also causes soil erosion. And also it, uh, our speakers have spoken about various things about the various water bodies. And so even choking of the drains. One of the very important thing I like to mention, the saving of energy by reducing groundwater. Pumping. This is where many people we try to, you know, neglect it that groundwater recharge. When you recharge, you actually save the electricity for pumping the water for back for your use. So if you are able to store that water on the surface itself, and then it, that means that you are storing the water, and that way you are also contributing into not using the electricity, not using energy. For groundwater. So this is where I would like to emphasize this. So it has a very big cycle. It has got a multi uh, advantages of this kind of things. And it's not very rocket science that you need a very high level of expertise, but a common plumbing, common uh, common uh, sense actually prevails upon it. Uh, uh, so that's very relatively simple. Uh, so in terms of uh, there has uh, there there is some complex situations where. You require certain trained professionals. Sometimes my maintenance cost becomes a little high. And if not maintained problem, this can cause some kind of uh, algal bacterial growth. If it is not properly maintained, tanks if not constructed properly, might result in leakage. And sometimes there may be some kind of uh, corrosion, which may go and add to the water quality. And similarly, so these are the normal things which uh, the water container. And those issues which also depend on this. So this is not very anything unusual on this. So component is very simple. There has to be catchment, like we have a roof or any area. We have to have a delivery system, which is a conveyance system, and then you have to store the system. And after storage, you need to use it by any way. You know, this is a common thing. So this is a very simplest thing. Is that it can be harvested in varieties of ways. You can directly uh, harvest it from the rooftop. You store in the tank. You can also use a runoff in the you know rivers. You can put into that water underground tanks. You can also uh, you can in the small ponds, which were you know by earlier speaker Mr. Panda has already spoken quite a lot on that. And collection and transfer water into percolation tanks, so firstly discharge into the ground. So there are many ways, and this can be done at community level or individual levels. Both levels is quite possible, or people do that. Storm water can be also used in terms of advantage, etc. I can see that it is, uh, sorry. Uh, let me get rid of this one. Can I remove this uh, the screen? Where is the full screen? Fine. Okay. So at the community level, the water can be collected utilizing in uh, you know some kind of water bodies storm water drains are tapped in the rainwater harvesting check dams can be provided artificial recharge structures this is where a, a caution is required when you talk about ejection wells 
in the drains. There's a lot of caution required. I'll speak to you about. So there has to be institutional buildings, etc. can be done. So this could be done at the community level. Individual levels, you can put it on your rooftop or whatever the small area you have. You can also put on the government building. This requires, of course, a policy, political level and policy uh, uh, from the government and enforcement. Policies are there, but enforcement is there, which right now is quite voluntarily. And you know things voluntarily works for some why it works and uh, it works in a limited scale, but uh, at the moment it's voluntary. In some of the space, it is mandatory to models are rural and urban. You know, rural are urban are traditional methods where we harvest it, uh, you know, and that we use it for agriculture or domestic or drinking water. In ponds are there now. These practices are there followed by recharging the ground waters. And these structures are known with a lot of names: uh, tankas, nades. Talabs, Bawdis, Rapats, Kuis, Kuns, Khadins, Johar. So there are various names which are popularly known in different different areas. So uh, that's okay. Examples you can see that's where the say you know Bawdis or Bawadis or Boris, which are the names. And there are some they are open one, and the water is collected and used. And similarly, there are underground tanks where the water is conveyed and it is stored tank. So these are the some of the temples are there. In urban areas, mostly it is, uh, you know, rainwater harvesting and where we have a roof as a catchment, you have, uh, even if you have a solar nowadays installed on the rooftop or anything which you have on the rooftop, that doesn't have, make a difference. So it's a roof basically, and the gutters and down the pipe, the fresh pipe, because when after uh, rainy season, I mean, before the rainy season, there are a lot of uh, storms, a lot of dust comes in that, sediment or silt particles are there. So maybe the first has to be flushed it out. You don't restore it, you filter it, restore it, and then you collect it and then you distribute it. So these are the simple examples which you could see very easily. There are pipe systems and these pipes could be uh, not necessarily to be a GI pipes or things. They can also be relatively cheaper and lighter, which are into you know GRP pipe or uh, these HDB pipes or PVC pipes. So those are the simple things. Motivation is very simple. So there are two areas where do we have plenty of water? If we have plenty of water, honestly, motivation is very low level. If you have relatively water scarcity, good water quality scarcity, then there is a motivation. If I get something free, there is hardly any motivation. If I have to pay something, there's a motivation. The, the kind of money which you one pays in India for water charges, they are practically peanuts in terms of what kind of cost does it happen. Most of the water supply schemes are subsidized or they are by the taxpayers. And then you only are being charged some operation maintenance costs. So motivation is that we have fast urbanization, unplanned growth, a lot of industrializations, Unfortunate environmental laws are not poorly, they are poorly enforced. They are the institutions are uh, challenging there. One institution and two other institutions, they don't much have much synchronizations. There is a political will, lower less, lower mode, depends upon the situation. There is a manual water issues, and there is a change in seasonal regional water demand. There are technical issues, poor data collections, climate change. So all these issues are a typical urban water sector, India. Water resources in terms of availability. My groundwater, I just mentioned a few minutes back that uh, my groundwater is uh, where I have, uh, you know, uh, in, uh, in my groundwater is my where I have depletion, quite fast depletion. And in that, uh, when I have depletion, I have uh, uh, the problem. I keep on changing many times, two years, after 10 years, 15 years. My whole water supply scheme, which used to have with the certain pumps, I had to go for do a new tube wells. And that has resulted into an expensive water source and depletion of water sources. So these are the some very strong motivation is there, especially in those areas which are uh, water scarce area and urban areas, even we are close, Delhi is like, for example, Delhi cities uh, in a uh, Ganga Basin, is that like Yamuna is part of Ganga, so it's a Yamuna Basin, Ganga Basin, and uh, compared to like Chennai, which is, has got the 
uh, very water scarcity. So those people who have got a cost where the scarce the water, they know the importance of this. So this is what I would like to say motivation part. So what are the policies? What are the governance? If we talk about governance globally, globally people are working on that. And it is not only one part that we talk about only the rainwater harvesting or restoring the water, but also we try to say that reuse of water, reuse the water, whether it's a waste water, whether it's a ray water, or it's a gray water, so all kind of water. So there have been policies globally uh, from the WHO, from United Nations, and there are standards for water use, and also reuse, when you say the reuse, the use, what kind of use you are going to have? Are you going to have the use for drinking? Are you going to use for industrial application? Are you going to use it for uh, irrigation? So obviously the standard of the water obviously varies on depending on the water use, but in terms of standards, there are plenty of them. And then they, these have been developed recently. And this says uh, globally, this aspect are, is being handled and there are guidelines. So in terms of water reuse, there have been guidelines for uh, reclaimed water. Reclaim can be from the rainwater harvesting, it could be reclaimed from the wastewater treatment too. So there are uh, policies. So I'm just putting some, some names here, the Canada, China, Israel, Japan, Jordan. In fact, uh, Israel is too much, you know, it's, uh, they do 90% of water, they try to reuse. So that because of this again, water scarcity uh, country, but they have been quite efficiently and uh, smartly. Jordan, Mexico. So name of the country, you will find some policies. So Tunisia, Turkey, US, Greece. So and that's the reason I'm just putting. So our country, you know, like India, the many Ministry of Water Services, of course, now it become Ministry of Jal Sakti. And so there have been some of the programs like Water Mission. Now the Jal Jeevan Mission has gone, the Namami Gange program, and the, the policies, uh, framework of the water. So there has been emphasis on recycling, storing, rainwater harvesting, all kind of are part of the policy uh, in terms of even the MOEF uh, policies, environmental policies, uh, in clean energy policies. We talk about all these central and state government has got. So when I talk about this kind of policy, there are plenty of policy. Ministry of Housing Urban, they also have the policies on the treated water, reuse them, store the land. They also have policy for making the, uh, you know, houses, household for making some rainwater structures. So yeah, that way we are very good in making it. And some of the initiatives which have been taken by small and large scale government and non-government organizations all over India, which uh, when you try to pick it up in kind of information bank or data bank, you will find plenty of them. And then there are good stories and uh, most of them. So one of the question I just heard that how the local govern, government works how they respond to these needs. I just heard, you know, from the previous speaker, uh, there, there was a question that how the local government affects. Again, this matters, I'd like to tell you, many times it said it's your problem. So you handle it. I mean, there are policies, policies are there, but again, governance, maintenance, all this, all deep, many times depends upon the local factors, but by and large, the government, uh, you know, uh, you need to develop your own state. You need to develop your own society or you maybe have, so it, it's a mixed kind of uh, response. It's not like everywhere it's very good, everywhere is very bad. So it's kind of a mix up. So there are authority national level who are directly involved in rainwater harvestings, uh, you know, board for central groundwater board, the uh, central institute of the research, which is, does a lot of uh, rainwater harvestings, including the Czech government sector. Central Regional Research Institutes, Ministry of Rural Development, Ministry of Water Sources, which is just now, uh, Rain, Rainfall, National Rainfall Authority, Ministry of Drinking Water. So there are many such authorities, National Commission for uh, uh, this uh, uh, the agriculture. So many authorities are there, uh, which they talk about it. These governance issues are there. The governance uh, guidelines are there. But when we talk about rainwater harvesting, the very, in terms of governance is fine, but what about social acceptance? Is the social accepting the blue water as drinking water? If society, where you're talking about it, blue water is being treated as a drinking water. Is the village, is the household who has a rooftop on his, you know, on his roof, on his house, is he eagerly or is he voluntarily 
is he willingly participating or is by force of the law is participating you know so these are the some of the social acceptance because if you are using that water when the rain comes it because you should remember or everybody knows that rain water is very good rain water is absolutely pure it doesn't have much salt so even for cooking purpose it's very good because lesser salt you know gets a good cooking very early cooking but at the same time if you store the water for several months and then use it only when the uh, my other sources get dry or my other sources of water is relatively less and in that time you use the water perhaps i had to be careful whether that water which i'm going to use as drinking water is good enough does it meet the standard of the water and if so then then there should not be a big problem so the acceptance social acceptance to any kind of these structures similarly whether my household think that he is spending the money he is spending the effort on the rainwater harvest structure whether his efforts are worth it in terms of monetary values in terms of availability values is it worth it if it is worth it then he will do it if you think it's not worth it that he may not do it you may ask him to do you may try to give them incentives but then those incentives should be sufficient that he should be able to do that and there should be check and balance there should be regular monitoring there have been few years back i saw a, a structure in bangalore where they are mandatory it was a mandatory uh, you know in terms of uh, rainwater harvesting so water was stored after the rain somebody guy came and he flushed it out you know to the drains so that means there was hardly any willingness towards that use it was necessarily by mandatory by law it is made so here that particular society or that particular building for his owner was not finding enough economically why will economically attractive to participate in this program in using this water and it is not necessary that you have to use that water for the drinking there are many use where you can think of using that water of uh, you know for the this rainwater harvesting the traditional practices of water water collections whether you see whether they accept those who are accepting it's fine totally they know not worried then there's quality water quality health issues there are bacterial water quality issues insect uh, you know vector issues and then water treatment and disinfection if you are going to use it for your direct portable use if it's not direct portable use if you are used for you know cleaning your uh, garage or even your vehicles or putting into the drink uh, irrigation putting your horticulture or cleaning your flushes then of course uh, the water quality in direct since they are not directly in your uh, you know your use uh, in your human touch hence they can be you know relatively uh, graded but then it's very important to take care of that so if i am able to take care of these issues then perhaps i am able to uh, i will able to encourage i am able to motivate enough for the rain water harvest structure a rain water harvesting because governance is fine but the governance you know until i have a i have a you know motivation i have a, and most of the time motivation will be economic economic motivation you know in the cases you know when led bulb came you know i am talking led earlier it was cfl then it was in chemistry lab what was the motivation was it to uh, participate in the program of the energy conservation of the government no 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 nobody it was even if it was, it was expensive but it was straight forward economy where everybody understood that seven watt of the bulb which is equal to 60 watt of the incandescent dam if you calculate with the cfl if you know 10 uh, 10 watt cfl if you calculate its life cycle cost it was being found that it is very cheap so similarly happened in the rain water harvesting when if you are a, absolutely in a very water scarcity area that's very different thing but if you are not in that then economy comes in a very strongly so this has to be understood very well economy viability has to be there where if i am having a free water supply from the various government sponsors scheme then cost of storage nobody is going to look at your proposal at all your investment if it is very costly in afford unaffordable no the cost of reprints maybe then what is the way out we may we, we can incentivize this maybe we meet some cost of that
Professor Kumar? Where he can have, you know, uh, where he can have a, a simple maintenance. I just cite a small example. It is, I think, few years back, I went to a very nearby under Unnad Bharat Vyan, which is the Ministry of Education program, where as an institution, we adopt some of the villages, clusters, and one of the clusters we adopt. And I found this only two biogas plants were there. And I found out what the reason. The reason was, first of all, the schemes were not properly aware care thing, and there was no mechanism for maintenance. Even those who have got two, they had did not have enough enough possibilities or enough uh, you know provisions of getting maintenance done. They didn't know to who will maintain. So the very first thing is that those who had to maintain, you had to create a network. And today you will not believe today that they have 40, 40 such stations in that village. Because so that means you need to have a post construction post commissioning arrangements for maintenance. You just cannot leave that, oh, no, no, I have done so fantastic work. It doesn't require maintenance. No, it doesn't work. You will have some problems. And for that region, in those areas, you need to have, and perhaps there, the government may come into picture that maybe certain cost is borne by the government, certain cost by, by the beneficiary. So there are the areas which are required. And of course, soft loans, et cetera, these are the business models which is appropriately can be adopted. Government has introduced many bills and laws for the nationwide execution of renewable assisting and government recharge. In not only the funds to provide it to the farmers, NGOs, et cetera, uh, the national water policy also increases on that. Groundwater board, uh, groundwater board also identifies so many areas for artificial recharge. You know, aquifer bathing management program also has been done to assess this quality of our sector water. States like Punjab and Tamil Nadu are providing subsidies to the farmers to practice, you know, practice for the rainwater harvesting. Model by building by laws. They are the model building by laws in 2016, where Ministry of Urban Development has laid some laws which includes provision of rainwater harvesting. It is mandatory for the new building to have a water harvesting, which is having a, a plot of 100 square meter and above. That means roughly 1,000 feet, 1,000 square feet or so which in all the states, all the buildings will have minimum discharge of so 10 kilometer, or must implement wastewater recycling the systems. Similarly, 30 percent rainwater mandatory by enacting laws. So when I try to say that, there have been many laws available in the country to go for the rainwater harvesting. The master plant sectors are there in many areas. So that's, that's fine. So Delhi, I would like to just cite a small example of Delhi Jal Board, though Delhi is known for many, I mean, many things, many new or bad, but Delhi Jal Board, you know, has uh, taken many initiatives that they made in mandatory as per that model bylaws. And then they need to have, if you have a, a discharge of 10,000 liters and above per day, you need to have a water recycling systems and you can that recycling system water you not necessarily that you use a fresh water but that recycling you can you are not for portable on energy but also you can use for political purpose and delhi water and sewage tariff policy provides that the having a 2000 square meter area property is having installed function on this thing they will be granted 10 percent of the you know rebate in the total bills and 50 percent if both our systems have been set up and are functionals so this is a incentives, and this is perpetual. This is not one time. Every time when a bill comes, you get a ten percent rebate. On a similar line, like when we have this, uh, you know, uh, solar water heater systems. Solar water heater system. If I ask you that, how does it help? Does it help the utility? Does it help discom distribution companies? It helps a lot because it reduces its peak power requirement most of the time. Your water heating requirement or comes in the morning for your when you go to the you know the bathroom for the bath, etc. The way the heating requirement comes more. And that is the time when peaking comes. If I'm able to reduce the peaking, I'm able to reduce my cost of the peaking because the peak power is more expensive. So the water heat system, solar water heat systems have been encouraged, and utilities have given them carrot, okay, 100 rupees per hundred liter. Per month, if I give you a rebate on your bill, would you install a solar water system? And you will not believe that a lot of people have done that. A lot of people did that. And there, so these kind of incentives, these are perpetual. And who wins it? Is it the you who put a solar water system? He is a winner, or he is the beneficiary, or is the 
discount company is also beneficiary because discount company is beneficiary because they need not to put an extra you know strengthening system into the distribution to take care of that peaking load so these are the, some of the things which i would suggest that the finance these incentives their initiatives are encouraged uh, to encourage the rainwater harvest structures and the governance should be part of that you not necessarily that one model works somewhere like for example in business model very nice business model can work like in you know cities like uh, mega cities even cities who understand business very very well but some kind of financial models a different kind of financial models can work in different places depending on the socio economic conditions political conditions so all that can happen differently so in terms of you know there are policies that they are there we have the you know watershed development programs where these initiatives are there to have the you know rainwater harvesting uh similarly the dams for collection irrigation tanks uh, uh, practices followed in agriculture in situ soil moisture conservation uh this many the center has been established long back and there have been a lot of programs through this uh you know rain fed areas this programs is happening and similarly the drought prone areas program desert program integrated watershed men they have a, a quite a large uh, fund available Uh, for this and uh, where this kind of uh, rainwater structures uh, are uh, there so what is the resilience of this rainwater structure invention build groundwater resilience by diverting fraction of runoff into shallow aquifer you increase the groundwater availability leads to crop intensification and it's very essential to build water resilience by supporting rainwater structures we need to have encouragement to the rainwater systems in commercial institutional areas government take follows some of the steps like technical know how should be provided by the government maybe free of cost so that people are encouraged to use that you know many times there are hesitation in a, so if something is available i'm not ready to pay for consulting but if i'm getting some this kind of consultation by volunteers any water centers can be set up in the each district also so can be run by ngos or others and uh, so that uh, they can provide the technical assistance to the common public and they also create the it should be simplified structures and thumb rule for the designing and later on for maintenance so this is the ability this will be uh, quite resilient for my structures and future of rainwater section is uh, an alternate decentralized water source slowly and we many times we have bad quality of water uh, because of uh, internal corrosion etc and then we have uh, so this system is growing nationally internationally and so the, like other countries we are also growing at this so there are many recommendations that we must have rainwater harvesting at individual and community levels we must regenerate water bodies and best water water perspective should be done and which we should also talk about water shared demand water supply reducing non revenue water improving water pressures water regulators we must have a good rational water tariff which unfortunately is not at the moment we must recover the whole onm if you are able to recover whole onm without subsidies and with lot of efficiency perhaps rainwater harvesting still will have a much uh, you know favorable place enforcement of environmental laws we must one has to coordinate with various central and state authorities Re reduce recycle reuse waste management these are the key buzzwords which we we talk about it just to give an uh, example that uh, this uh, year march 31 and uh, march 22 31st march 2022 we got two structures inaugurated please understand rurki is a place where i have a water available at 2 meter depth to the depth we have a, a lot of advantages that our water is available at the shallow depth so that means my cost of water uh, pumping is not at all but as a responsible institution we created two structures as a model as a demonstration maybe in few years time we will may expand it we try to do the recharge storage and shaft and pit all kind of four models we installed it and like you see that one of the models you can see and at the one of the hostels we did it so these four models we did it in march 31st we and more details are available on our website on this and so we did it one kasurva bhavan with inmates about 7000 students as uh, sorry 700 students where 
area of about water was uh, the roof is about 915 is a multi story building where roughly 7.5 liters per uh, year kind of water recharges. So while we recharge, we have to be careful. We had to filter it out with all the standard filtering process, you know, those we have learned in the uh, schools, primary schools, you know, with the different layers of uh, my, uh, you know, sediment size or boulder size where I have educate. And then we had a, we are putting a recharge through a abundant fuel. So in the abundant fuel, we are recharging it. So though it's a, uh, I just said that since we have only a shell or water available, it is honestly speaking, it is basically for, you know, since we are a, 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 a education institution, so it is basically for purpose of uh, uh, demonstration, pilots, etc. Similarly for our uh, uh, storage models, we have a storage, which you use it for, uh, you know, as a shaft and also for the recharge pits where we are trying to recharge it, not through the shaft, but through the normal, uh, the normal uh, procedures of uh, having a recharge. So this is again 425 square meter area, where about 3.5 liters per year, uh, something we done. So this is as a, uh, this year only we did it. And when we, you know, uh, when we have received this kind of uh, message that we should have a demonstration and we as a response institution, we did it. So this is what I uh, planned it for today's uh, presentation and uh, in view of the time, and I would like to take the questions, please. Thank you, sir, uh, for this excellent presentation and sharing your insights uh, with our participants. Now I will move on to the Q&A box. The first question is by Somia Cha. The question is, is there any training program for government bodies or officials on water awareness at local level? You see, this uh, point is highly pertaining and it's, it's a very important topic, uh, a very point you're saying. Under the Jal Jeeval mission and this under Jal Jeeval mission, I would like to say that a lot of programs are happening. And if you look at the, there are training institutes, they are also trying to have you know, this Har Ghanal, you know, every household will have a uh, tap water, similarly conservation. As they are plenty of programs, but I really don't know that which are the programs where all programs are put in as a, a singular database. But if you, uh, you know, see those regional centers or institutions, uh, which have been, uh, you know, identified by the Jal Jeevan mission, this information can be available. But if you can drop an email to me, I will be able to help in that sense. Prakash is asking, how can the community participation be encouraged? We see that there is always a need of someone to take the initiative. Can we have an institutional approach? And how MNREGA can be made a part of rainwater harvesting? You see, as far as the rural areas, I mean, MN Rega is concerned, it can be part of that very simply. And in many of the villages or many of the people are using it. But as you said, how the institutional support can come in. For that region, I think Jal Jeeval Mission and, and others also are trying to have every district, every tasil have a, a, a rainwater harvesting center where people can go and they can take the you know details of that what kind of structures are there and who can do that job and for them so these are things like in my in our institution uh, we have a national institute of hydrology our national institute of hydrology set up a center for this they do this exercise quite a lot they keep on announcing the various uh, you know in the various uh, through the meeting and they keep organizing sustaining programs so i would like to say without institutional support because common man is a fence sitter and also not only consider, he must see some good example, then only come forward. So for that region, the institutional mechanism, a very strong mechanism, if you have to spread it in a, uh, everywhere, has to be there. And that support must come from the government. You're not charging directly to them. You cannot charge them directly because they have, will be beneficially much later. So this is the things like you are opening the schools, you know, you are opening the health centers, Similarly, you are opening this rainwater harvesting centers where the awareness and the kind of uh, models and the kind of uh, financial help if it is required to the banks or some kind of uh, uh, grant or subsidies. And there, these kind of things are to be there. So institutional support is a must 
to make it very otherwise it will be still reveal is sporadic only you know it will be sporadic you remember just to give an example uh, for uh, if you want to have solar water systems how to do that do you have institutional support yes there are agencies there are centers who gives this kind of thing and then you go to that similarly when the led bulb claims to become a spread over then there have been a you when they went to your places you they went to your mohallas you they went to your villages to with a bulb and a lot of awareness creation so you require institution and it's not only one day it is has to be sustainable you to to be permanent because this kind of things will be long term dr sangeeta ji is asking collection of data analysis and communication to all and finally the action plan needs to be conducted what are the hindrances in each step for a successful planning uh, see i just give an example of delhi jal board delhi jal board is in ganga basin in terms of ganga basin lot of water but delhi does not have much of water they have to depend on the water quite a lot with the state of uttar pradesh state of uttarakhand state of haryana and in of course in addition to that what ground water so they need the water so the water value of the water delhi knows better than any uh, like uttarakhand people i mean like as lurki if you compare so for that reason they come forward with various things and i think they also have these uh, you know this uh, regional places where these red water harvesting centers are there if i am not wrong they have some units where people can get on this either so those states or those areas where you are power heavy water deficit these institutions are working very well even today but in those areas which are like uh, we are not the water uh, you know we are not water uh, deficit or Well, then this will not work easily. So why is it like for example Tamil Nadu? Tamil Nadu has to work very well. And if there is just some issues, the the barrier which you mentioned, it, I would like to say barriers is the one where people see that it's a small thing, very small things. Still, people think that water is a subject where I must. It's a government duty to get me the water in my home. Those people who know. Uh, if you those people who go and fetch the water in the rural areas many kilometers you know even today even today if we are doing very well after such a you know harghar jal you know program even 50% people have their water in their home even only 50% today after such a large you know nice program so which is uh, earlier it was only you know uh, something about uh, maybe 15% only so with this kind of uh, uh, need and the government or state government has to come forward central government can do of course do can do it. and in this process i would like to encourage that jal jeevan mission should also play a uh, more active role in that uh, rather than because these kind of things which is in a in a national level only can come from the this nation comes from the state i mean the union government level and of course those states who will those who need this water they will do much better and they should do better so i would say that uh, that much i only i can say i, I will not be able to say more than that thank you another question is by velly velly ji the question is so why rainfall is decreasing in north east india and increasing in north west india in fact if you uh, i know last year i did some little analysis on the east uh, east india also like odisha area you will not believe that in uh, you know in the river uh, that's called uh, what is the name of river it's about 5000 square meter there are many dams there water is increasing a lot so there is a variation the climate change is happening and climate change let me tell you all the people are very several experts keep on working uh, in the climate change area and they have found that certain shifting is happening shifting in the water from the you know is happening little towards uh, so the shifting in the towards west side and some of the shifting happen on the east side and in the northern side is a little less but should you remember that number of rainy days are reducing but my total rainfall not necessarily reducing my that means what if my number is reducing number in rainfall reducing my intensity is increasing that is the reason you you i have more my when i get a rain i have much more uh my my uh, my intensity of rain is much large compared to what used to be earlier it's not that it was not but now it's much more so uh, the reason is very simple is climate change climate change impacts uh, and this is a global phenomena 
and uh, it has got a lot of atmospheric science uh, behind that and uh, that's what I like to say. Uh, Dr. Swatiji is asking, can you suggest rainwater harvesting system for Barmer region other than Tanka? I really, I know the Barmer area, so, but I will not be able to really, uh, I will not be able to really, I know their yeah, operation rate is quite high and temperature is also quite high on that side, but I will be not really, I'm, uh, I have not studied that part and I, I'm sorry, Dr. Swati, that I will not be able to answer you right now, but uh, I will ask my colleagues and then if I can answer you later on that. Because Tanka is, of course, one choice, but other choice I need to discuss with my uh, colleague uh, who may be knowing more than me on this particular uh, aspect of this Barmet village, uh, Barmet, uh, you know, area. So, Meji is asking, there are few region drought areas in Rajasthan and Bundelkhand where water scarcity can be understood. But in Bihar, where flood comes almost every year, still there is scarcity of water. Why is that so? It's management. It's a simple management of water. You see, many times what we... Some, uh, see, there are two sources of water. Surface water or ground water. Surface water, as I as also know that, it comes only for two months, three months in the larger quantity. And the quantity is 100 times more than the lean quantity. So if I have to use the water for 365 days, state, say state of Bihar is relatively flatter area. It's in like you can say my slopes are very mild. And that is the reason when the river comes, they start meandering also. A lot of sediment, which they bring it from Himalayas, that's right to settle. And then the river start meandering, especially like Kosi, Gandak are very famous for that. The problem the, is the water management. Need to... I either I use the groundwater or I use the surface water. Surface water, perhaps making the dams is not solution in the uh, in a, emitting a dams is not there because it's a flatter land. So you cannot make much of the maybe some smaller uh, area can be. Then you must do some kind of groundwater. Groundwater has to be adequately managed in this case. So this withdrawal. So you say basically a management problem, not anything else. Not anything else. The last question is by Shailender Ji. How much demographical conditions make difference? When you say demography, I would not say that any demography has really an impact on that. It's basically economy, availability and economy. These are two factors which actually cause, uh, which are more uh, serious factors uh, on, uh, you know, you know, that's Mizoram. I think, I hope you know the state of Mizoram. The state of Mizoram, use the rainwater harvesting from ages, you know. They are the highlanders. They don't live in the valley. They live on the top of the hill, on the ridges. So for them, if they have to do the water, they don't go and fetch the water from the ground and go to the three kilometers down the hill and they get it. They, they, they harvest the water. Rainwater harvesting is in their blood. So it's like demography when you say it is not really, it's basically need. It's a need. If you need, you will do it. Mizoram are very good examples, and that's region since they live uh, in the high. They are also known as Highlanders, and they are the one they use rainwater harvesting very religiously. So it's uh, demography in that sense it matters, but in terms of need and economy, they are the two things: uh, uh, availability, uh, need, and an economy. Sir, uh, Shridhar is asking uh, if you can suggest any good book. I will certainly do that. I will certainly do that. I'll send this thing to uh, maybe to the uh, to you, and then you can send it to me. Yes. All right. Sir. Okay. So, uh, thank you so much, sir. Sir, if there's any concluding remarks and way forward. Well, my uh, very simple remark is that uh, rainwater harvesting is uh, very good. And uh, it has to be economic. You have to encourage it. And those weak points, like I said, the institutional arrangement has to be, effective institutional arrangement has to be in place. Incentivization must be there. Must be there. Yeah. Until incentivization there, people do not work. Or you have a situation like, uh, you know, where water is really scarce, where you have no other option to, like rainwater harvesting, as I said, Mizoram. 
we just cannot think of not having a rainwater harvest takes because they live there and their water has to go up from there. So these are the, some of the things which I like to conclude it. And those, uh, yeah, I would like to encourage it is like uh, some of the models which I just shown you of my own institution uh, with a lot of thinking we did it. And I would like to, and now we are thinking to do it on each and every building. Though if we in money part is relatively, but then we want to demonstrate and we want to see that this thing is uh, it right. Uh, this goes into directly head to the visitors in students that, uh, you know, parents and all that is go. So with this, I say that it need to be encouraged. Thank you so much, Professor Arun Kumar uh, for your discussion. And we hope to learn from you more in the future uh, in similar courses. Now I would like to invite our convener and moderator, Sri Pikender Singh Panwarji to uh, conclude the session. So over to you. Thank you, Dr. Sorvi, and uh, uh, I think it's been, what, exactly, so almost uh, 11, we start, three hours, three, three, six, and three, almost nine hours, nine to 60, that means 540 minutes of uh, this training program, and you've been a constant listener, so thank you so much, Sorvi, for being there right through the first day to the last, and to the last, from the first minute to the last minute. A pleasure, I, sir. I know, I know how challenging that is. Uh, at the same time, I would also like to thank our, uh, our participants who've been there. I mean, the number was always kind of constant, right? Uh, so, a good number of people have actually participated in this training program. And not to miss the fact, our presenters, our experts, you know, who've taken out the time, and uh, it's all pro bono. You know, it's, uh, we don't pay anything. To, to our uh, panelists, and it's just a kind of uh, knowledge sharing. Uh, so, which is, uh, I think, which is very important in present times where everything is getting commoditized, and so is water. So, therefore, you know, I think that's another very important aspect that we must not forget. We must not uh, miss the point. Now, uh, I don't think I have to summarize the discussion because uh, uh, I think we'll be bringing out uh, uh, the entire discussion in a textual form and uh, hopefully we'll bring out a book so that it becomes a, a kind of, uh, not a module, but you know, kind of a, a comprehensive uh, work of uh, all our experts so that uh, they are able to understand uh, what kind of uh, interventions have actually been done uh, what are the realities? What are the challenges? And uh, let me, I think, start right from the policy paradigm. Because, and and I, I just, before I forget, I think there was a question asked to recommend two books. I would recommend two books, in fact, uh, on water. The first one is written a few years uh, back, and that's the Blue Gold. One must, uh, one must actually not forget that. And uh, so that's the Blue Gold. And uh, the other book is uh, uh, The Assorted Cities, written by Subtendu Biswas. So uh, that's on Delhi model. So uh, what, what I think is, you know, the, and, and as Ms. Raman has uh, rightly pointed out, let me just start from where he left. Actually, we should not miss the uh, fact and the point, the kind of uh, interventions that we expect from the state and kind of, you know, uh, budgetary spending that is taking place uh, on the uh, on on this water sector, which is very quintessential for uh, for uh, you know taking uh, this onerous task of uh, rainwater conservation forward. Having said that, uh, and you know going uh, uh, by all the discussions that have taken place, I think there is no uh, second opinion to the fact that we have to actually uh, uh, a focus emphasis on uh, the policy uh, parameters, the policy paradigm. We have uh, like, and, and this is what we've been discussing that we have different agencies working for probably the same cause. So um, what, um, what I suggest is not that, you know, you converge the agents, but at least we can, we can converge the tasks, the work that is important. And uh, uh, so therefore the urban development and the 
responsible with the water uh, department, you know, I mean, comes under different, like we have the irrigation public health, we have the PhD department, then we have the Jal Shakti Abhiyan. There is what we, what uh, requires uh, complete conversion. So that's, that's one aspect. The second aspect, I mean, which probably uh, uh, is also uh, more desired is what kind of utilities are we looking at? And what kind of uh, responsibilities and, you know, what kind of uh, transparency are we looking at uh, when we are building these utilities? And this is what actually Arjun uh, uh, wanted and asked me to speak about the Shimla water utility, uh, you know, our experience and example. Uh, that comes out from Shimla. And I just want to say that, you know, there is not duality, there's mul there, there is multiplicity of, of agencies, you know, somebody who's extracting water, somebody which is, uh, you know, uh, um, is in the process of production, and then, then there's another use which is in the process of distribution. So, uh, I mean, so, you know, but the, but the, but the end, result that i mean the end user consumer happens to be the human being and so you know the human being is not interested i mean whether a b c d or whichever agency is responsible the point is that we should get indicate quantity and of course portability quantity and quality which is very important so therefore the utilities that we're talking about I mean, and one aspect which uh, also emanates from rainwater conservation is, uh, you know, the whole business of, uh, of uh, you know, water purifying companies. I mean, if you see uh, the, uh, the mandate and the constitutional framework of the different uh, uh, organizations, for example, the municipal corporations or the Delhi Jal Board or the PHE department, to name them, everyone has the responsibility of providing a adequate quantity and B, portability, that is quality and quantity of water. So if they are responsible for providing the, uh, for, for uh, you know, measurable uh, quantity and, uh, you know, qualitative, then why should we go into and, and uh, go into buying uh, water purifiers, which is a huge, huge, uh, you know, kind of loss for, for, the, for the people. So I think that is another aspect which we must link with the rainwater uh, conservation because after all, all this further leads to how we provide, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, the 135 electricity uh, water that is uh, necessary for all our people. And this leads to, uh, you know, I mean, is water a class issue? I think that that also came into our discussion. I think it's a very much class issue for the simple reason. And this is what Sikhindu points out in Delhi, and this is what we got to know when we were discussing it in, in Delhi. Uh, just let's understand Delhi in three different uh, conjoints. One is main in Delhi, another one is Latin, and the third one is contained. I mean, I, I mean, maybe people do not even know, you know, the per capita availability or per capita distribution of water in these three different aspects is like really startling. Whereas the mainland Delhi doesn't even get 135 electricity, it's lesser than 100. The, the Latins Delhi gets around 400 electricity. I mean, that's, and the contumen Delhi gets almost 600 electricity, 600 liters per capita per day is what we have. So, you know, I mean, I mean so, so that's why utility is something very important when we talk about utility. How do we manage utility? How do we bring in the transparency? How do we bring in transparency in the utility? I think that is uh, uh, that is one of the important uh, uh, aspects that we should not forget. And lastly, uh, if you just, uh, I mean, what has been flagged in the Rajya Sabha uh, to one of the questions that was raised, and this is what we, uh, what came out in one of our presentations as well, that 80% uh, uh, of groundwater is uh, now contaminated, you know, with, with the, uh, and I, I, I'm quoting it from, from the Rajya Sabha proceedings, I mean, just two or three days back, uh, that there are excess amounts of plastic metals. So what is it that is happening? I mean, where are the agencies? Where is the pollution going? I mean, I've seen the reply given by the minister in the, in the parliament and the Rajya Sabha saying that, you know, it's a state subject. Now, all of a sudden, water becomes a state subject. I mean, so that's why I think, so these subjects, whether it's state subject or it's a union subject, concurrent subject, or even the municipality subject, so the subjects are subjects and they're citizens, you know. So, um, and if 80% of water is not fit with groundwater, and, and we know 
uh, uh, it's only 20% water, surface water, I mean, 80% comes from groundwater. So where are we heading? I think, so all these aspects, right, from rainwater conservation to quality, to all these aspects must be dealt with. And I think this has been a very interesting uh, presentation, uh, discussion, and we look forward for more of these in thanks to come. I think with that, I would thank everyone. Thank you, sir, so much for sharing your insights and concluding the session. And now I would uh, invite Dr. Shweta Bedia for uh, announcing about the certificates to the participants. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you, Dr. Saravi. Uh, so at the first, I would like to congratulate Imri for choosing up this wonderful topic and very successfully organizing these three days. Um, wonderful online training program. Thank you so much, everyone, for your effort. But at the same time, I would really like to congratulate all our participants and also thank you because, uh, you know, without you, it's never a successful program. Thank you so much for joining us. So uh, whom, uh, who are there who normally join for all our programs, they all know, but if there are someone new, um, so I'm going to, uh, you know, say a few things. Keep this in mind for the future programs as well, and for today's, uh, you know, these program as well. So, uh, first thing is that whenever you are uh, registering for any of our programs, um, please register with your proper name and um, mail ID, and also whenever you are joining any of the training program use that same name and mail id and because most of the time you know while preparing the uh, um, list of uh, attendees we see that people have joined the program with the name like one two three four or del one two so you know the name that you are writing here that will be the same name you will be getting in your certificate so if you want the really you know uh, a certificate which is of any use to you, then please write your proper name so that your certificate is prepared on that same name. This is one. Also, uh, one more thing is for any of the running program, you need to participate the program or be online for the 80% of the total time of the three days. Or if the program is going on for five days, then five days. If it is a webinar, then in that case, for that single day, but you have to be 80% of the time, you have to be present. So this is a second thing. And third thing is that once this program is over, normally it takes us, you know, two to three working days uh, for uploading your attendance. And after that only, you will be able to, you know, generate your certificates for that. No need to mail or message or phone call to anyone because anyway it will be generated only thing is um, at present we are facing some issues you know some technical glitches in our website so the uh, certificate generation might take a little bit of um, you know more time please bear with us for that but what you definitely do is once this program is over go back to your uh, you know from where you have joined the program go back to that place and there you will find one uh, feedback link, okay? So please feel that feedback link because without giving feedback, you will not be able to download the certificate, okay? So all of you, please go back there and uh, fill the feedback form. And in two, three working days, we hope that our problems will be resolved and we'll be able to upload your certificates. Thank you so much for participating. And I wish that in our all the future programs also, we'll be able to see you there. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Shweta. As we come to end of our online immersive online certificate training program on implementing rainwater conservation, practitioners' perspectives on rainwater harvesting and efficient local water governance and resilience. I, Saurabhi Himire, researcher at IMPRE, IMPACT, and Policy Research Institute, would like to propose the formal vote of thanks on behalf of IMPRE and NIDM. This training course is organized by National Institute of Disaster Management, Ministry of Home Affairs, and IMPRE's Center for Environment, Climate Change, and Sustainable Development, or 
CECCSD Impact and Policy Research Institute. We thank the patron for the program, Sri Taj Hassan, convener and moderator, Sri Pikender Singh Panwar. I would like to thank our conveners, Professor Dr. Anil K. Gupta, Dr. Simi Mehta, and Dr. Swamedip Chattopadhyay. We are very grateful to all our expert trainers, Dr. Anamika Barua, Dr. Indira Kurana, Dr. Jania Mukherjee, Dr. Fawzia Tarannum, Ms. Anjali Makhija, Dr. Brajesh Kumar Dubey, Sri B. R. Raman, Sri Ranjan Panda, and Professor Arun Kumar. We thank all of our participants who have raised pertinent questions and were actively involved in this three-day training program. We thank you for being interested and putting your time, energy, and efforts in understanding emerging issues concerning the impacts of policies and disaster management and helping us to bring together the practitioners and participants to this course, which we believe must have benefited us immensely. Thanks to the organizing team of IMPRI and NIDM for conducting the whole session in a smooth manner. We thank all those who are watching us live on Facebook, YouTube, or listening to our podcast or reading our publications. We hope you continue to join in future to our IMPRI web policy talk and web policy learning. Have a nice day and thank you.